Thank you. That concludes topical questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion 10490 in the name, in the name of Elena Whittam on drug law reform. I'd be grateful if members who wish to speak in the debate were to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on Elena Whittam to speak to and move the motion up to 15 minutes, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to open this afternoon's debate on drug law reform and regret that due to being ill with COVID, I am unable to be there in person. Problem drug use impacts many people in Scotland. It leaves two lives ending prematurely and tragically. 1,051 lives in Scotland were lost to drugs in 2022. And whilst that number was fewer than it was in 2021, it is still far too high. More than 1,000 families have lost a loved one and to each one of them, I extend my heartfelt condolences. The drugs death emergency in Scotland remains a priority for this government. The topic of this debate is drug law reform. It sets out evidence-based actions that we would take were we empowered to change the legal environment in which we find ourselves. No one should infer from this that we are not doing everything within our current powers to address this crisis, or that we will not continue to learn and adapt to meet the challenges we face within the current legislation. However, there is clear evidence to show that much more could be achieved if we had the authority to fully implement the public health approach we are committed to. The principles upon which our national mission set are that problematic drug use is rooted in poverty and trauma and is a health condition. And that is why we are committed to not only reducing the number of people dying of overdose, but also to improving their lives. The £250 million over the duration of this parliament has already contributed significantly to this goal. The MAT standards are improving access and service delivery to people in need of treatment and support, and the number of approved residential rehab placements has grown to 812, including facilities specifically targeted at families and women with children. Our naloxone distribution programme has won international acclaim and we are progressing our commitments to safer drug consumption facilities and drug checking initiatives within our existing powers. I'm happy to take an intervention from Sue Weber. Sue Weber. I, I thank the Minister for taking her first virtual intervention. You mentioned children and families being at the heart of trying to break that cycle and trying to save lives. Why is it then that we've got social workers that are increasing higher and higher faces number of caseloads when young people are going to get less and less time with those invaluable social workers to help break the cycle? Minister. I do recognise the concern um, that Sue Weber has just um, uh, intimated there, um, and our whole family approach, um, underpinned by our whole family wellbeing fund, is actually going to help to, to secure um, additional resources and support to those frontline social workers, because we really do recognise their value in the lives of our families and young people across the country. We are supporting a broad range of community-based initiatives and looking upstream to understand how we can support people to avoid drug-related crises at a much earlier stage in their lives. And we know that uh, childhood poverty and trauma are often factors in later drug dependence. Our Child Poverty Bill, which sets out targets to reduce the number of children experiencing the effects of poverty, and our Promise to Care experienced young people aims to improve outcomes for those young people and help them to achieve their potential. Stigma drives people away from help and creates a whole raft of additional problems for people who use drugs and for their families. And we're taking forward a plan to address this longer term, this long term problem. And through our Charter of Rights drafted by the National Collaborative, a group made up of a broad cross section of our community, including people with lived and living experience, we will directly support people with or affected by problem substance use to claim their rights up to the highest attainable standard of health. All of this is, and more, is currently underway as part of our public health approach. The so-called deterrent approach has shown to be completely ineffective in reducing drugs use and counterproductive in addressing the underlying cause of this phenomenon. The Misuse of Drugs Act is over 50 years old and was designed against the back ground and a political environment of the time. But the landscape has changed and the international evidence available has grown. I've given examples of the significant progress already made to this point through our national mission, but current laws hamper our ability to implement further measures known to save lives. And that is why we published our drug law reform paper, A Caring, Compassion and Human Rights Informed Drug Policy for Scotland in July, with the support and endorsement of the Global Commission on Drug Policy, comprising former heads of state from countries as diverse as New Zealand, Switzerland and Peru. 
We proposed immediate changes to the law that will allow us to fully implement a public health approach, which has had significant results in a wide range of other countries, saving lives and encouraging people to seek support and treatment earlier than were they to fear punishment. This includes providing a clear statutory framework for supervised drug consumptions and drug checking across Scotland, increased access to the life-saving naloxone through reclassification, changes to simplify and improve licensing to enc encourage the full suite of treatment options available to us, including heroin-assisted treatment, and the removal of the stigmatising and discriminatory exemption in the Equality Act disability regulations, which excludes drug dependency, and a commitment to full consideration to decriminalising drugs for personal use. Presiding officer, you are 16 times more likely to die of a drug death in Scotland in the poorest 20% of the country than you are in the wealthiest 20%. Criminalising our way out of a drug death crisis rooted in health and social issues often has the effect of punishing people from our poorest communities for being poor and having experienced trauma. This government is clear. The war on drugs is over, no one won, and the main casualties were not organised criminals. They were the poorest and most vulnerable people in our society who need our help, not driven further into the margins of society. We have learned from evidence around the world and have committed to reduce the harms associated with drug taking by promoting agency, helping people to make better choices and by giving them accurate real-time information about substances and their effect. And we continue to progress our plans for safer drug consumption facilities because the evidence supporting their efficacy is extensive. There are currently 16 countries who operate legal drug consumption rooms, all of which are effective in saving lives and improving health outcomes. The facility currently proposed are designed to comply with our current legislation and as such will still be restricted by the Misuse of Drugs Act and will not fully, fully meet the lowest threshold criteria that we would absolutely prefer, but will be a very positive start to our journey to protect all of our citizens. They will help demonstrate efficacy at a national level in the way that they have shown to in other countries. No country offers a template for tackling drug use, but I make no apology for proposing approaches that have been shown to make a positive difference. New Zealand and Canada in particular are investing in drug taking services which have as few barriers to access as possible. Accidental over happy to take an intervention from Michael Mara. Th Mara. Thank the Minister for giving way. Now that the barrier to um, safe consumption room pilots uh, is out of the way and we can move ahead with that, what update can she give us on drug checking services, which uh, ministers have claimed have a, a similar barrier? Yeah. Uh, can she report on what uh, progress has been made by the government to deliver a pilot in that area? Yeah. Minister. Yeah, I thank Michael Maher for that intervention. Um, over the last two years, there has been um, uh, work undertaken by the, the University of Stirling to actually look at how we would roll out pilots of drug checking within Scotland. Um, and during that um, phase of, of research, um, um, several areas were identified as being um, potential um, places. So we know that Aberdeen, Glasgow um, and Dundee um, have expressed a wish to, to be part of that pilot. Um, and now that that research has published um, at the end of July, we are now moving to the phase of actually applying for, for helping those areas to apply for licences. We are awaiting final um, communications from the UK Home Office that will help us to make sure that those licence applications can go in and be met with the most symp sympathetic ear as possible, so I will keep the Chamber updated on that. Accidental overdoses often occur because people do not know what's in the substances they are taking. Um, and Scotland faces a significant challenge with street benzos, which are extremely variable in their makeup and in strength. We must therefore seek to implement these drug checking measures, which lower the risk and make people safer, particularly in the light of potentially even more dangerous synthetic drugs reaching the streets of our country. Happy to take uh, intervention from Alex Cole Hamilton. Alex Cole Hamilton. Um... I'm very grateful indeed for the Minister uh, taking my intervention. Um, Presiding Officer, the Minister, in her response to Michael Mara, points, I think, to some real progress that's being made by her government. And I support them in that regard in taking forward pilots. But she also speaks to the uh, red tape and the, the time that's taken in terms of proving the efficacy of these things. Now that we actually have legal clarity about safe consumption facilities, at this time, the, those facilities will be limited to Glasgow. Um, what's steps can her government take to ensure that people outside of Glasgow can see similar pilots undertaken in communities affected? Minister. 
I thank Alec Cole Hamilton for his intervention, and I do share his um, wish and desire to see um, safer consumption facilities and indeed drug checking facilities rolled out across the country. Um, as soon as we have the safer consumption um, pilot up and running in Glasgow, um, we will seek to make sure that we undertake evaluation of that in a timely manner and as soon as we possibly can. After that, once we understand how it's working and in practice, um, we will then seek to have conversations with other areas that may seek to, to have the same type of facility available. We are still going to be constrained because this is a pilot for that specific area, but I'm happy to have conversations with the Lord Advocate to see how we can progress that as swiftly as we possibly can do. Our paper also proposes to decriminalise all drugs for personal use alongside a wider review of drug laws. The reaction to this proposal from certain quarters was as predictable as it was misinformed. Some have um, referenced a recent press report that paints a, a bleak picture from Portland, Oregon, who decriminalised drugs in 2021 and claimed that it wrought havoc in an already struggling city. And to this, this, I would say it does indeed carry a lesson, and that is decriminalising drugs alone is not enough. A fully committed public health approach like the one this government has embarked on is required to address the health and social problems that drug use is a symptom of. Portugal decriminalised drug use more than 20 years ago with, full, with implementing a full range of treatment and support initiatives for people who use drugs. And its example has been followed by a number of other countries precisely because it works to reduce drug-related death and increase the take-up of treatment and support. There are also people who claim we already have de facto decriminalisation. And that will be news to police, who last year recorded 22,356 drug possession crimes, which was 38% of all crimes against society. 30 countries have recognised the harm caused by criminalisation and moved to change their laws. That gives us more than a hint that a change in laws in Scotland would be consistent with the conclusions that experts across this area have reached. The fact is that decriminalisation is no longer a novel proposal. It is a transition supported by the chief executives of all 31 United Nations agencies. That has been their position since 2018, when the UN Chief Executives Board agreed the first UN Common Possession, which committed to promote alternatives to conviction and punishment in appropriate cases, including the decriminalisation of drug possession for personal use, and to promote the principle of proportionality to address present overcrowding and overincarceration incarceration by people accused of drug crimes. In our drug law reform paper, we also propose further exploration of drug law with a focus on evidence and the reduction of harm. This means having a drug classification system which reflects the evidence of harms caused, not political or moral judgments, as well as facilitating a conversation about reforms such as the regulation of substances in partnership with the public and the subject matter experts. Like many things we now see as common sense, this would have been radical once, but no more. Multiple committees, experts and independent organisations have already called for an urgent review of the Misuse of Drugs Act, including the Independent Drugs Death Task Force. So there is a compelling case to change our drug laws. However, we are currently unable to change those laws in line with international evidence. And there are three possible roads out of that impasse. And it will surprise no one when I say that Scottish independence allowing us the freedom to make our own laws with, by and for the people of Scotland is my preferred route to change. But we know that we need the compassionate evidence-based drug laws and this transcends political alignment. It is about saving lives. The second route would be for further powers to be devolved. Given that both governments disagree on this issue, the devolution of the necessary powers would allow Scotland to develop laws that properly reflect our different public health approach. And this kind of devolution is not unheard of. Regional variation exists in other countries. Canada, Australia, and even the United States now have different legal frameworks on drugs operating within their countries. But clearly the fastest and simplest way forward is for the UK government to review and change the Misuse of Drugs Act to support a public health approach across the UK. We would welcome meaningful engagement on these proposals, but despite many attempts, that's not forthcoming. Up to this point, our proposals have been rebuffed, despite the cross-party Westminster Home Affairs Committee just last month recommending a review of the current drug laws, including endorsing our position on safer drug consumption. We have long called for agreement from the UK government to allow us to do this, whether to support us in establishing a full pilot or through devolving the necessary powers to do so. Because first and foremost, people affected by drugs 
are people. They are deserving of kindness, respect and of dignity. Our drug laws quite simply, quite literally, are from another century. We need something that reflects what is required now, and that is laws that are not rooted in prejudice, assumption and moral judgments, but are instead based on research, evidence and best practice from around the world. Laws that reflect lived experience and the experience of families affected by drugs, a caring, compassionate and human rights informed drug law which will save and improve lives. Presiding officer, I would like to end with a thank you and a plea. My thank you is to everyone who has contributed to the national mission, including many in this parliament, everyone who has helped shape our approach to reducing the impact that drug use has on far too many lives and communities in Scotland. And my plea is to those who remain to be convinced that drug law reform is required. I say to those people, look at the evidence of what works successfully elsewhere. Why should we not seize the opportunity to improve the life chances of so many people in Scotland? I move the motion in my name, and thank you. Thank you. Um, before I call the next speaker, I would just say we do have some time in hand this afternoon. Um, members may wish to know that. And I now call on Sue Webber to speak to and move Amendment 10490.1, up to 11 minutes. It sounds a bit strange today. I can, maybe it's my, I don't know, but uh, who knows. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome the chance to open the debate for the Scottish Conservatives this afternoon and I move the motion in my name. And I'm sure we can all agree across this chamber that each and every drug death is a tragedy, and there can be no doubt that our drug death crisis is an emergency. But saying this repeatedly, here in the chamber, in reports and in the press releases, that doesn't save lives. Under the SNP, drug-related deaths have spiralled out of control. Drug deaths in Scotland have more than doubled since the SNP came to power. And the SNP's current strategies to help those struggling with addiction have failed and are still failing. I've just started, if you don't mind, uh, maybe in a sh short moment, Mr McPherson, thank you. That are, that are just enough, or they are not being put in place fast enough, where it matters, on the front line. Scotland still has the highest drug death rate in Europe, and despite having the same drug laws, Scotland's drug deaths are nearly three times the rate observed elsewhere in the UK. Mr McPherson, I'll give way. Ben McPherson. I thank the member for taking the intervention. Um, would the member agree with me that, I, while I appreciate as an opposition member she's wishing to hold the government to account, actually all the main parties in this chamber have been in power over recent decades. And the issues that we're confronting together in our communities are d issues that have, in many cases, uh, been... Uh, have come to pass because of decades of, of, of challenge and consideration. Would it be, not be better to just have a collegiate approach uh, to serving our communities better? Sue Weber. I, th I think I will accept the sentiment of what you stated, but the SNP government have been in control of Scotland for 16 years in these things. And it was the previous First Minister in her role as then Health Minister, or Health Secretary, don't quite know her title, that cut the funding to our drug and rehabilitation services. And that was at the point where our crisis began. That was point zero. And remember, just last week it was revealed that there have already been 600 suspected drug deaths in the first half of 2023, up 7% on the same period last year. So implementing the MAT standards will help us in the fight against drug deaths Yet the Scottish Government have missed their target of fully implementing the standards by April 2023. And this is just another key missed target by the SNP and Greens in their woeful handling of Scotland's drug death crisis. So much so that the Green members cannot even find the time to come to the Chamber this afternoon. Having already been forced to delay the full implementation of the MAT standards by two years because they were so far behind schedule, ministers failed to meet their revised interim target. These standards were introduced to tackle that shocking record. So it is unacceptable that the Nationalist Coalition continues to fail to meet them. At the beginning of summer, of summer recess, Hamza Yosef's drug minister called for heroin, cocaine and all other drugs to be decriminalised. But I believe that doing so would encourage the organised crime gangs who make fortunes from peddling their drugs on Scotland's streets. The minister stated... Lessons have been learned from around the world. So let's look at places elsewhere in the world which bitterly regret this failed experiment. Portland in Oregon decriminalised drugs in 2021, but only earlier this month, officials were forced to U-turn 
due to a marked increase in overdoses and deaths. They have claimed the step brought a brutal amount of human misery to the Oregon city and Portland police have reportedly logged record deaths since the state of Oregon decriminalised this. Oregon is seen as America's one of America's more progressive states, but the Portland Commissioner of Public Safety, Rennie Gonzalez, said the city has seen the homeless population rise by 29% while there has been an increase in crime. He said, the amount of human misery is just brutal. It is truly horrific. Portland, Portland and Scotland share many values, but the addictive qualities of these drugs are so brutal that it simply overwhelms your system. I will. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful to Sue Webber for taking my intervention. She's uh, citing to the Chamber one international example, but does she recognise the strides that have been made by the country of Portugal, who had, until quite recently, um, one of the worst drug death rates in the world, yet through a model of decriminalisation have brought that rate right down? Sue Webber. <sighs> and I will correct if this is required, but my understanding of what's happening in Portugal is the records and the recording of deaths has changed also. So I wouldn't be quite as uh, pointed in citing Portugal as a shining example. After being told Scotland had just 425 rehabilitation beds, the Democrat Commissioner Rennie Gonzalez said, I'm deeply concerned and I would encourage Scotland to try to avoid the tragedy we are going through. And if you're going to go down this path, make a strong commitment to addiction services and emergency intervention. The Scottish Government recently announced 14 million funding that would take Scotland up to almost 600 rehabilitation beds across Scotland. These beds are vital and will be even more so if Scotland were to decriminalise drugs. All of us across the Chamber can agree that more action needs to be taken. However, the Scottish Conservatives do not support the decriminalisation of drugs. Decriminalising classy drugs will not help tackle Scotland's drug death crisis and could make it more difficult for the police to tackle the criminal gangs that profit from this trade and cause misery for our communities across Scotland. It would do a disservice to Police Scotland who work tirelessly 24-7 to tackle these gangs. I recently visited uh, Children's First, a charity in Bathgate, and I met a woman who told me about the troubles her daughter faced after she got cu caught up in cocaine use. This led on to her using other drugs that ultimately meant this girl's life and her family's life was shattered and torn apart. The woman I spoke to had to sell the family home to pay for, pay for rehabilitation for her daughter and to clear the debt hanging over the daughter and the threat to the girl's life by the criminal gangs supplying the drugs. It is gangs like these who could be encouraged by and profit from the decriminalization of drugs. We must have an approach that encompasses criminal justice, social justice and health. And I agree that the issue of drug addiction must be treated as a public health emergency, but the Scottish Conservatives cannot agree with the way in which the government motion undermines the very important role of the justice system too. Project Adder is a yet another tool that could be used to help tra tackle our drug-related deaths. However, this is disappointingly viewed rather unthusiastically unenthusiastically by the Scottish Government. Yet in Blackpool, a Sunday Post investigation found Project Adder worked in part because it, made, it was making recovery a priority. And the SNP Green Government is just focused on decriminalisation with no plans to get people off drugs. Nevertheless, as a result of this continuing crisis, we, the Scottish Conservatives, will not oppose the use of drug consumption rooms and more specifically, the pilot in Glasgow. Sue yes, I will, Mr Doris. Mm -hmm. Bob Doris. I thank Sue Weber for giving way, and I've listened really carefully. I don't agree with a lot of what you've said, but I, I, I know you're, you're firm, firm in your views. Would you agree that, irrespective of your own personal views, a full and proper review of the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971 is vital to test the proposition of our Scottish Government, because we think we're doing the right thing, but a full and proper view of that Act is surely a positive way forward, irrespective of people's views within this place. Sue Webber. Again, the situation we're facing in Scotland is far, far graver than people are facing elsewhere in the UK, where exactly the same legislation is in place. We have to look internally at ourselves and what we're not doing 
to help save these lives. That's where I am. We do have serious reservations back on drug consumption rooms about their operation. And we must remember that drug consumption rooms are not a silver bullet and they won't solve all our problems. However, it is vital that the Scottish Government takes every practical step it can to tackle the epidemic of drug misuse sweeping our country. And I would like to ask, ask the Minister specifically, or perhaps uh, uh, um, Marie Todd in her summing up, if she can answer these questions in her contribution later. How does the Minister foresee the Glasgow drugs consumption rooms actually working on the ground? What will the evaluation methodology be, and will it be made public? And what is going to be measured? And just as importantly, will there be an independent assessment of the, and review of the outcomes? I've heard from people who work in drug rehabilitation service or are in recovery themselves, and they say that they would not oppose, absolutely oppose drug consumption rooms either. They do have concerns around the funding. And this is a concern that I share. Where will the money for the drug consumption room in Glasgow come from? Is it to come from the existing health and social care partnership budgets? What other services are being cut to release these funds? As I said, I have reservations about the effectiveness of consumption rooms. And the decision made by the Lord Advocate last week explains why. Confirming that the SNP government can proceed with a drug consumption room pilot if they wish. This has given the SNP one less hiding place when she... Uh, hold on, I've lost my place, sorry. This will give the... The Scottish Government can proceed with drug consumption and pilot if they wish, gave the SNP one less hiding place when she removed the threat of prosecution from a consumption room pilot scheme where Class A drugs can be taken under supervision. Which, remember, the SNP Government had previously insisted would require a change in UK law or independence. Neither has had to take place. This decision tells us that there was always a way for us to do this, and the SNP now have one less excuse for their failures. Anne-Marie Ward of Drugs Charity Favour UK has said that safe consumption rooms need to be underpinned by vital access to prescription programmes, detoxification and rehabilitation services, as laid out in the Right to Recovery Bill. It is now up to the SNP Government to demonstrate that safe consumption rooms can work, to back the crucial Right to Recovery Bill and to finally start tackling the drug death crisis that Nicola Sturgeon and now Hamza Yosef have presided over. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. And I now call on Jackie Bailey to speak to and move Amendment 10490.3 up to nine minutes, Ms Bailey. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Can I start by wishing the minister a speedy recovery? Presiding officer, let me open on a note of consensus with the minister. Because every life lost as a result of drugs is a terrible tragedy, and my thoughts are with those who have lost loved ones. In truth, far too many lives have been lost since the Scottish Government declared the drug crisis a public health emergency in 2019. More than 4,000 drug-related deaths have been recorded. And the figures appear to be still rising, as 600 suspected drug deaths were recorded in the first six months of 2023, and that's 7% up on the same period last year. And I also very much welcome the announcement from the Lord Advocate that there will be a presumption against prosecution of people using safe consumption rooms, removing the obstacle to providing such a facility on a pilot basis in Glasgow. It will be important to have an early shared understanding of how the facility will operate, what the evaluation framework looks like, so we can measure success and learn for the future. It would also be helpful to clarify what protections there will be for staff should something go wrong? Is their liability limited as well? So I hope the Minister will provide further information as the thinking develops. Let me turn to the SNP motion, and I, I genuinely regret that we are again debating constitutional issues and seeking to divide rather than to act. Safe consumption rooms were proposed some six to seven years ago. The law has not changed in that time, but the Lord Advocate has acted in a proportionate and, in my view, sensible way to enable a pilot to take place. Why was this not done six to seven years ago? In September 2021, the Lord Advocate confirmed that there was a legal route to pursuing safe consumption rooms. That was 24 months ago. Why has nothing happened until now? Lots of people 
feel very let down. They are angry about the lack of action and using constitutional wrangling as an excuse. And all this time, thousands more people have died because of drugs. Nicola Sturgeon apologised in 2021 for having taken her eye off the ball, having declared a public health emergency two years earlier. But I fear that the present government have sadly learnt nothing. I give way to the Minister. Minister. I thank Jackie Bailey for giving way and also for her well wishing. I would just like to point out um, that once the new Lord Advocate did take up her position, um, she did um, lay out to the, the Justice Committee the parameters by which she would um, be willing to look at um, a proposal for a safer consumption facility. Um, the, uh, the Scottish Government, Police Scotland and um, Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership then worked solidly um, for about six months to actually bring a proposal forward. That proposal went to the Lord Advocate in June of 2022. And I do thank the Lord Advocate for taking the time to actually come to um, a decision on that. But to suggest that nothing had been done in the intervening time is simply not the case. Jackie Bailey. I say to the Minister, and I welcome her intervention, clearly nothing has been done for six to seven years. I appreciate the current Lord Advocate's position, but it's the same Scottish Government, the same policy for a safe consumption room, and that policy has simply not been delivered before. So people do feel let down. You know, the law on drugs is the same in England as it is in Scotland, exactly the same. Every word, every comma is identical. Yet here in Scotland, drug deaths are three times higher. So it really isn't the law that is the issue. And simplistic arguments about where power rests are just simply not credible. We need action from government, not more distraction in the form of fights with Westminster. Now, I know the SNP don't like to hear it, but the powers to end Scotland's drug crisis lie in St Andrew's House. This includes power over our entire health system, drug treatment services, mental health services, social care, policing, and prisons, to name a few. And don't just take my word for it. The former head of the Drug Deaths Task Force, Katrina Matheson, has said, the Scottish Government needs to focus on what we can do now in Scotland without trying to divert attention to Westminster and the Misuse of Drugs Act. David Liddell, former CEO of Scottish Drugs Forum, told the Scottish Affairs Committee, we certainly do have a frustration that the Misuse of Drugs Act is used as a means of delaying responses. And finally, Darren McGarvey, anti-poverty campaigner, said, add safe consumption rooms to that list of things that were doable in Scotland ages ago. And while I welcome the announcement, we have to be frank and say this is clear evidence of how governments play politics with people's lives. Surely the minister recognises that these experts need to be listened to. And how does she respond to Audit Scotland, who warned in 2022 in its drug and alcohol services update of a lack of drive and leadership by the Scottish Government? I repeat, the powers to end Scotland's drug crisis lie in St Andrew's House. Now, we know that we are dealing with a complex and wicked problem. We need a clear understanding of the underlying causes of addiction so we can begin to tackle them at their root. We need action to increase the availability and range of support services and treatment. And, you know, we need to recognise that harm reduction, treatment and rehabilitation go hand in hand. The government are very keen to point to the increased amount they're spending on drugs and alcohol from 2019 onwards. What they fail to mention is the period before that when they cut the budget by £46 million. It is astonishing that they now want us to congratulate them for simply restoring their cuts. Presiding officer, I also this week got an email from a GP in Glasgow, from the Pollock Shores Medical Centre, just next door to the First Minister's own constituency. He described the underfunding of primary care and the decreasing budget to treat those with alcohol and drug addictions. The Drug Misuse National Enhanced Service is the specific funding stream is not grown at all, not at all, in the last 16 years since the SNP came to power. At the same time, as the combined rate of inflation makes it well over 80%, so it's suffered 
an effective real terms decrease. He makes the point that many addiction teams are attempting to move more stable users to primary care so that they can look after the high risk cases. But you know, due to this lack of funding, most GP practices are not able to provide the help required. This GP notes that if funding is effectively halved, then care will suffer. And he asks, is it acceptable for this to continue? I put that question to the government. He goes on to say, I really think for the sake of many vulnerable patients and their families whose lives are blighted by drugs misuse, that this would be a positive step towards lowering suffering and deaths. And you know, it's not just primary care services, presiding officer. There are services such as Turning Point in Glasgow. They're closing their doors to women with addictions because their budget has been slashed. Local addiction projects in my area have had flat cash settlements for the last decade, effectively a real terms cut to their budget. Against that backdrop, I understand that over £2 million has been identified for the Safe Consumption Room pilot. Can I ask the Minister in closing, will that be additional funding or are cuts being made to treatment services to allow that to happen? Rehabilitation beds were cut by this government and Scottish Labour supports Douglas Ross's bill that gives a right to rehab. We recognise that it is not in and of itself a silver bullet, but it is an important provision that will help in the fight to tackle drug misuse. And so I hope the government will support it. I'm in my last minute. Since 2007, there have been 13,000 confirmed drug deaths. But this is not the full story because these figures do not fully reflect the scale of the problem. The Minister's predecessor committed to exploring how the wider range of harms of drugs beyond those where drug overdose is the cause of death can be recorded. And I would be grateful if the Minister would update Parliament on this. Presiding officer, it takes seven years to get to this point with the safe consumption room. I really hope it doesn't take another seven years before we have drug testing services. It's 14 months since the Drug Deaths Task Force reported, and yet no formal application has been made to establish drug checking services. It is simply not good enough. We know that these facilities will reduce drug-related harms by allowing people to get substances of concern tested for content and potency. And then, of course, there's the MAT standards promised 18 months ago, still not fully implemented. Standards 1 to 5 were supposed to be implemented by April this year. That's not happened. Presiding officer, let me close and let me repeat. The powers to end Scotland's drug crisis lie in St Andrew's house. Stop the distraction, stop the sleight of hand and get on with the job. Thank you. I now call on Alex Cole-Hamilton. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. And I have great pleasure in speaking for the Liberal Democrats in this important debate. Uh, Presiding Officer, in 2019, this Parliament declared a drug deaths in Scotland to be a public health emergency. It was the right thing to do. But since then, over 4,000 people have died in that emergency, 1,051 last year alone. And they are sons, and daughters and brothers and sisters whose lives and potential have been extinguished far, far too soon. We're almost desensitized to words like that, to words of condolence uttered by parliamentarians like myself in speeches like this. But we cannot afford to become inured to this. Each death was a preventable tragedy, and we know it was preventable because we hear about the tools and how to address it in international best practice and in pioneering work. We need to work together to save those lives. I know I speak for everyone in this chamber when I say that I want the Scottish Government to succeed on this. I'm also very glad that we're having this debate today and looking at every option on the table to stop people dying. In July, the SNP stated on social media that the drug deaths crisis was worsened by, in their words, a hard and callous approach by Westminster. That actually abdicates any responsibility for the decisions that they have taken. We know, and we've heard in this debate, the existing power settlement, the Scottish government's, uh, the, under the existing power settlement, the Scottish government slashed budgets for drug and alcohol services by almost a quarter. That's £1.3 million a year for the nation's capital alone, serving, severing support, sending services to the wall, which people relied upon. And that in itself turbocharged this problem. 
We know, under the existing Paris settlement, that the party of government chose to look away while the independence referendum unfolded. Kenny McCaskill, the SNP Justice Secretary at the time, has said as much himself. The disproportionately bad situation in Scotland is not a product of the devolution settlement. But we can't ignore that we may need to tailor a particularly Scottish solution to something that has become a particularly Scottish problem. Presiding officer, Glasgow has drug death rates 10 times those of London. When 100 people a month are still losing their lives, we need to be open to anything that will save them. And I will rest momentarily on the uh, example of Portugal. Sue Weber and I had a brief exchange about the Portuguese decriminalisation model, and she says that reporting may make that inaccurate. But let me tell her that since that happened in Portugal, we have seen the social impact of drug use fall by 20%. Drug-related workloads have decreased, and HIV infection due to drug misuse has fallen by 90%. That is an unmitigated success by any measure. So if there are levers in the 50-year-old Misuse of Drugs Act that might allow a Scottish government of any stripe to tailor that particularly Scottish solution to stop people dying, then I am open to that discussion. I have been saying so for the past two years. If there, are any ever, if there were ever an issue to set aside our differences on the Constitution and have an adult discussion about the powers that are needed, then surely this is it. Over the past decade, my car... I will, from Brian Whittle. Brian Whittle. I'm very grateful uh, to Alex Gohams for taking the intervention. He will remember the debate in March 2021 when the whole chamber voted for a motion which included uh, self, uh, self, uh, sorry, uh, consumption rooms because at the time we said we need to move this debate on. Would you agree with me that that progress since then has been really slow? Alex Cole Hamilton. I will, and that speaks to the exchange that I had with the Minister in my intervention on her remarks, that uh, so much about this is based on empirical evidence, on waiting for legal clarity, and every year that we don't implement steps like this, people die. So I, I welcome that intervention. Presiding officer, over the past decade, my party has led calls to treat this as a health crisis, getting people into treatment instead of channeling them into the criminal justice system. We have waited a long time for that action. I was relieved to read the Lord Advocate's guidance to police Scotland around safer consumption rooms in Glasgow, which would represent a landmark moment in the fight against this ap epidemic. But it was an obstacle that was put in the way by the Scottish Government for far too long. Scottish Liberal Democrats also want to see... I will... From Paul Sweeney. Paul Sweeney. Thank the member for giving way. Does he agree with me that it might be a case that there's a confusion over what constitutes decriminalisation and what constitutes legalisation? And that part of this confusion may be that the law officers of Scotland don't actually sit in this parliament, rather they are quasi-members. Alex oh, Cole Hamilton. I think that Paul Sweeney makes an exceptionally important point, and I think that is one that is wrapped up in the stigma that shrouds all of this debate, in that if you are seen to take a genuinely public health approach to the drug deaths emergency, that that equates to you somehow being soft on dealers or the organised crime gangs that actually um, that, that make this the problem that it is in the first place. And we have to be, use language carefully and absolutely clarify what we're talking about. So I welcome that intervention as well. Scottish Liberal Democrats also want to see new specialist family drug and alcohol commissions providing wraparound services because it's all very well to stabilise somebody, but it's important very much so to identify the reasons for their use of the substances they're using in the first place. Those struggling with drug addiction need a range of support which include health and welfare services as well as access to legal support and support in healing from unresolved childhood trauma. The government must also integrate drug checking facilities, as we've heard from Michael Mara, within existing treatment services and at events like festivals to tackle the rise in dangerous synthetic drugs, which are increasingly in circulation in Scotland and are claiming lives in my own constituency in particular. Work is also needed to be done to integrate NHS treatment with support from the third sector organisations who are on the ground, who are on the front line, who know this ecosystem. And vitally, the government must prepare right now to implement a network of safe consumption rooms across the country. It can't just be limited to Glasgow. The pioneering work of people like Peter Kriken lend themselves, lend a blueprint which can be rolled out across the country where it is vitally needed now. There is a desperate need for these services beyond the west of Scotland.
Take a walk just a few hundred yards from this building to my constituency and you will see people struggling with addiction at risk who could benefit from such a life-saving facility. Indeed, the situation in Edinburgh is desperate. Last year, drug deaths in this capital rose by 21%, even as the number fell nationally. There is no argument then that we need to get better treatment facilities here and right across the country. To that end, we should commit to providing local authorities with the necessary funding and the clarity of guidance to establish these facilities as a matter of urgency. Nobody should be forced to travel miles essentially barred from the treatment they need by distance. Finally, presiding officer, government may make good on a promise made by Nicola Sturgeon in 2021. During a statement in this chamber, the former First Minister promised to, and I quote, make additional funding available starting this financial year to make heroin-assisted treatment services more widely accessible across the country. Two and a half years later, there are no additional resources for heroin-assisted treatment across Scotland. Had the government made good on its promise, how many lives could have been saved? If you conclude, please. I will do. So I'd be Mr. grateful Hamilton. if the Minister, in her closing remarks, would inform the government of progress on that issue. Signing officer, our first duty in this place is to protect and support the well-being of the people that we are sent here to serve. We have failed in that regard. We need to move this agenda on. Thank you. Before we move to the open debate, could I just um, remind members who wish to speak in the debate to please press their request to speak buttons. And I call Colette Stevenson to be followed by Russell Finlay. <clears throat> Thank you, presiding officer. And I'm grateful to be able to speak in today's debate and members know about my own personal interest in reducing drug harm and tackling stigma, having lost my brother Brian to a heroin overdose in 2002. Comparing 2021 and 2022, the number of drug-related deaths fell by a record 21%. However, too many people in our communities, our friends, family, neighbours, continue to be killed due to drug use. The number of deaths is tragic. We must all commit and recommit to doing everything we can to tackle this. I welcome the Scottish Government's new proposals outlined in a caring, compassionate and human rights informed drug policy for Scotland. Care, compassion and a human rights approach are key to supporting people who use drugs and helping them on their journey to a healthier life, whatever that looks like for them. Of course, one of the best things we can do is prevent people from developing problem drug use in the first place. This requires collective action across many areas and every section of our society. Problem drug use can affect anyone, regardless of where you're from, your class or your wealth. Unfortunately, the statistics show that those from areas with high poverty and inequality are more likely to die from drug use. For people who use drugs, it is vital that we tackle stigma. It is a powerful thing and does nothing but compound the problems people face. Stigma so often causes even more suffering and prevents people from getting the help they need, and it can exacerbate already poor mental health. Alarmingly, the figures show that around 7% of drug-related deaths were classed as intentional self-poisonings. That represents around 73 people who have possibly taken their own life. And this figure won't include people who have an addiction but used other methods of suicide. For me, this highlights the need to ensure that people who use drugs have access to holistic, person-centred help which considers all of a person's needs. Poverty, imprisonment, having a difficult childhood, these are things that too many people experience stigma for. When you add something like addiction into the mix, that stigma can rise, with people left to feel worthless. Of course, people who use drugs have, in many cases, experienced all these things. Health and social care services have a vital role to play and I welcome the £250 million investment in improving treatment options. There is some amazing work being done in the third sector too. The Beacons is an organisation that works across South Lanarkshire, offering holistic support for people who have been affected by drugs. 
I am really happy to say that the Beacons have now expanded and have a recovery hub in East Kilbride, and I would like to invite the Minister to East Kilbride to learn more about their work to ensure that visible treatment and recovery are embedded into local communities. Presiding Officer, while drug deaths are falling, they are still too high. We must do everything we possibly can to reduce drug-related deaths further albeit the number of people dying is just one measure. Drug-related harms take many forms, and we must all recognise that and be as committed to reducing harm as we are to measures to stop so many people dying from drugs. Beyond stigma, other issues, even for those who have not used drugs for decades, include diagnoses of things like HIV and hepatitis, often caused by sharing needles. Thankfully, nowadays, these conditions can be managed well. However, for some people who have used drugs, these conditions can cause years of poor health. In fact, the Scottish Burden of Disease study shows that drug use disorders are the third leading cause of health loss in Scotland after ischemic heart disease and Alzheimer's and dementias. Presiding officer, we must stop the so-called war on drugs. Instead, let us focus on transformative change crafting drug policies which are based on evidence. Those are not my words, but those of Volker Tuck, the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights. As the Scottish Government has pointed out, the ambition for an evidence-based public health approach is being held back by Westminster's outdated Misuse of Drugs Act 1971. Short of proper reform, I welcome the Lord Advocate's announcement on drug consumption rooms. This is a positive step forward, offering what I believe is a radical tool to tackle drug-related harm. Eliminating the risks of sharing or using dirty needles will go a long way to tackle some easily avoidable harms caused by drugs and to reduce the impact on the NHS from problems that we can eliminate. Presiding officer, there is so much more I can say on this topic, but I will conclude with saying that I fully support the Scottish Government's motion and actions. We must be radical if we want to tackle the harm caused by drugs, and drug law reform is an important tool to achieve this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Stevenson. And I call Russell Finlay to be followed by Ben McPherson, uh, again in six minutes. Mr Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. I also begin by wishing Eleanor Whittam a quick recovery from COVID. Now, as every speaker uh, today will testify, Scotland has a deep-rooted, desperate and deadly relationship with substance abuse. Scotland also has a severe problem with organised crime. These are intertwined. These are inseparable. Yet organised crime and its culpability in relation to our nation's tragic death toll is a subject that is rarely spoken about in here. For reasons that I cannot fathom, the SNP government rarely shows any sense of urgency or even understanding about the scale and scope of the harm inflicted by these parasites. Parasites who prey on our most vulnerable, Parasites who use firebombs and firebombings to inflict terror. Parasites who contaminate society with their dirty money. And parasites who have zero respect for the rule of law or for the sanctity of human life. Yes, the chronic issue of drug addiction must be treated as a public health emergency. As the government motion states, you will not get an argument out of me or my colleagues on that point. But as Sue Weber said, the Scottish Government cannot accept the way in which the Government motion undermines the role of the justice system, public health, health or criminal justice. It is really not an either or. It is both public health and criminal justice. A robust and well-funded justice system is absolutely critical. To think otherwise is not only naive, but dangerously so. Now, one of the lines peddled by zealots who demand decriminalisation or even legalisation of all dangerous narcotics is that the so-called war on drugs is lost. Like King Canute failing to hold back the tide, they argue that drug trafficking can never be fully eradicated, so must therefore be tolerated and accommodated. It's a spacious argument, glib and immature, 
and the devastation that this would cause is quite hard to imagine. The message that societal normalization of heroin, crack cocaine and other drugs would send to our young people would be, I believe, unforgivable. And any politician who argues for what would become a narcotics wild west is mistaken and misguided. They also do a disservice to Police Scotland and the National Crime Agency, who work tirelessly 24-7, 365 days a year, to tackle the gangs peddling misery and death. Gangs that dupe the media, even some MSPs, by posing as honest businessmen, or worst of all, anti-drug campaigners. Scotland's organised crime groups number more than 100 and are mostly based in the communities I represent. They are keenly watching the direction this government is taking. They are rubbing their hands at the SNP's weakening of criminal justice. Look at places elsewhere in the world which now regret the failed experiment of liberalisation. Places where crime has risen and aggressive drugs gangs have flourished, not vanished. I will. Paul Sweeney. I thank the member for giving way on that important point. He is correct that organised crime groups are cancer in our communities and should be robustly challenged at every level structurally. Does he recognise, however, that there are interventions such as medicated assisted treatment, heroin assisted treatment, that can in some instances be effective at diverting revenues that would otherwise flow to illicit supply chains into more controlled um, and ultimately beneficial outcomes? Russell Finlay, I can give you the time back. Yes. Um, I'm not the only speaker today who will point out the breathtaking brass neck of this government. SNP ministers declared a public health emergency while inflicting severe cuts to addiction services. Shameful. They also took their eye off the ball, as Nicola Sturgeon herself admitted, while drugs deaths more than doubled. Shameful. Who dithered and delayed about the flow of drug-soaked mail into our drug-infested prisons. Shameful who set up countless talking shops while refusing to back my party's right to recovery bill to give addicts the treatment they need. Also shameful, and most shameful of all, who man manufacture fights with the UK government to distract from their own pitiful record. This government claimed that UK-wide drugs laws prevented them from decriminalisation. Not true. They spent years griping that the UK government was blocking drugs consumption rooms. Also not true. De facto decriminalisation for drugs possession in Scotland has in fact long been in place. When the Lord Advocate formalised this two years ago, standing right there, she said the option to prosecute must remain in place. Dorothy Bain understood the folly of allowing drug dealers to dodge justice by claiming personal possession. So I wonder if the Drugs Minister can explain why she now thinks the Lord Advocate is wrong. Shame on the SNP for using drugs deaths as a weapon in their tiresome constitutional obsession. Presiding officer, they have been rumbled. They must stop blaming others and they must stop making excuses. They must start accepting responsibility and start taking action. Back right to recovery stand up to the drugs gangs, support our police, listen to Scotland's drug ravaged communities, numbed by grief, and please spare the people of Scotland from an out-of-touch political class which is abjectly failing in its duty of care. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Ben McPherson to be followed by Paul Sweeney. Again, a generous six minutes, Mr McPherson. Thank you, President Officer, and I'm very grateful to speak in this important debate about this serious, complex and sensitive issue. I think it's important we have time in this parliament and perhaps we've not spent time enough over years and decades past talking about these issues with honesty, without dogma, without a sense of taboo, without stigma and judgment and based on the facts so that we can take our policy making and our considerations on this matter, in which there are no easy solutions, into a place where we make rational decisions and do so in a way with a philosophical approach and a practical implementation that is about harm reduction first, 
harm reduction first. Harm reduction first. The tragedy of deaths and suffering from drugs and a variety of substances within that term across Scotland has been too much. The effect on my constituency of Edinburgh, Northern and Leith over not just recent years but decades is well known. And I pay tribute to everyone in my constituency from organisations like Turnpoint Scotland, uh, Jackie Bailey mentioned them elsewhere in the country, they also operate in Leith, do remarkable work and all the different organisations making a difference to reduce drug-related harms, provide support, provide rehabilitation, treatment services, and uh, increase the availability of, of uh, naloxone for, for, be able, for use when, when that can make a difference. And the government's investment of uh, £250 million on the national mission uh, to address our challenges with drugs and to provide treatment in Scotland is, of course, all welcome. And of course, most of that focus has been on what would be known colloquially as harder drugs. And these are the most severe cases, the most severe substances of harm in our communities. Uh, the minister mentioned uh, street benzos, and of course, their, their damage is significant and growing and should be a concern to all of us. Uh, and the, the negative effects of opioids and indeed, uh, the fact that many substances on our streets are now stronger than they were years ago is all having a negative effect. Sure. Brian Whittle. Very, very grateful for Mr. McPherson for taking intervention. And you're absolutely right about the street benzos. And in the previous minister, I did ask her um, about that. She said it had risen by some 400 per cent in, in Scotland, but only in 50 per cent in the rest of the, rest of the United Kingdom. Do we have any idea why that is? Ben McPherson. I certainly don't have an idea personally why that is, um, but I would agree that, that is, if those facts are correct, and I take them in good faith, then that is an area that we should have public focus in terms of our criminal justice system uh, and, of course, the demand uh, for providing treatment and assistance to those individuals uh, who are affected by that would, would of course, be, be higher here in Scotland. Um, last intervention, Mr. Uh, Michael Mara. The, the member given way. It, it's on this very same issue. I mean, the reality is that street benzos exploded in this country when Valium scripts were withdrawn within the NHS, a policy decision taken by this government. I would ask him to reflect on his point earlier on, when actually in 2013 the drug death figures in this country completely detached from the rest of the UK. There is policy interventions and, and methods taken by this government that have resulted in deaths. Yeah, yeah. Ben McPherson, I can give you time back for both those interventions. I, I, take the members' points, and I'm sure the Minister will address these concerns in, in her response at the end. All I would say is that, um, and, I, and, I, and I don't think Mr Mara made that in a party political way, I think he did it in a good faith about the welfare of, 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 our, of our citizens, um, but uh, we all need to uh, focus uh, primarily on the challenge of street benzos in front of us now, and I think the fact that the government has brought focus to this in the Parliament. We have a dedicated minister, and the actions that the government are taking on a variety of issues, in, including um, the introduction of safe consumption rooms, which I absolutely think is, is a policy that is, is, is something we should definitely try, given the, the positive impact it has had elsewhere. The example of Portugal has been brought up by other speakers. Uh, undoubtedly, the, 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 the fact that Portugal's approach has made a positive difference is something that we should look to uh, utilise in terms of our learning. Every country is different and we'll need to think of our circumstances, but I think the government is right to, to take the approach that it has. Um, and within all of these considerations, uh, including decriminalisation of possession and possession only, as the government has proposed, that would also enable other resources, whether that's police resources or other services, to better help people on their recovery and rehabilitation and within uh, community support. Um, lastly, this debate is about uh, law reform. And I absolutely do think it's right that we're discussing the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971 in this parliament because it has such an effect on many devolved matters. 
And I would say this, that the war on drugs internationally and domestically has been a failure. And it's been a failure because we need solutions that curb the significant harms associated with problematic substance abuse and addiction rather than pushing this issue into the hands of organised crime and underground and creating that taboo and that stigma. So as we move forward, we do need to push the UK government to reconsider the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971. It is remarkable, and many would argue completely perplexing, that that piece of legislation has not been reviewed given its significance. It is clearly not fit for purpose, it is clearly not working, and it is clearly not enabling what we need most of all, which is what I started with, which is a sense of safety and well-being at the heart of all policy decisions. And this issue, and this has been alluded to by other speakers, is only going to become more challenging with regard to the developments in biology and synthetic substances. And if we don't get on top of this from a rational approach in this country and internationally, then I'm very worried that the dangers of those more potent substances that are developed uh, are being developed now, whether that's fentanyl or others, this is only going to become more challenging. So a dogmatic criminal justice approach only from the UK government is just completely unfit for purpose. Um, so they should be changing that law as a matter of urgency. And if they're not prepared to do the right thing and make the developments that are required, then they should certainly be looking at devolving it to this parliament where we are taking a harm reduction approach. Thank you, Mr McPherson. I can advise the Chamber we do have a bit of time in hand, so anybody taking the interventions will certainly get that time back. I call Paul Sweeney to be followed by John Mason. Yeah, around six minutes, Mr Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As I've said on more occasions than I care to remember, Scotland's drug death crisis is the most important public health emergency facing communities across this country, bar none. There is no silver bullet, Deputy Presiding Officer, only a fool would suggest that there is. The reality is that it will require a collective approach from every party in this chamber and a whole system response that embraces harm reduction methods and recovery services in equal measure. But I want to make clear at the outset the disdain with which I hold this government motion presented to us today. As tends to be the case, it resorts to constitutional grievance and makes calls for changes to legislation out with the control of this parliament before it addresses solutions that are possible using the powers that the government has had at its disposal for years. And there's no clearer example of that contemptuous approach than when we consider overdose prevention centres. Almost seven years ago, the previous Lord Advocate, James Wolfe KC, rejected the proposal for an overdose prevention centre pilot in Glasgow. Last week, the current Lord Advocate, Dorothy Bain KC, approved it, proving, as many of us have said, that this could be done within the current legislative framework. And in that time, over 7,000 of our fellow citizens perished and fell victim to entirely preventable drug-related deaths. What a horrific indictment of the malaise and indifference shown by this government and those in positions of power. It shouldn't have taken people like Peter Crichton risking their livelihoods and liberty to prove that this could be done on the streets of Glasgow. It is the job of the government, a job that by all accounts they failed miserably at. And today, when we could have had a debate on how to progress this measure to introduce an overdose prevention centre pilot in Glasgow, belated as it is, a measure that every single party in this chamber supports, we are reduced to the dismaying spectacle of this government squabbling over the Constitution. Deputy Presiding Officer, in the back of that old converted ambulance run by Peter Crichton, I worked with people trapped in the vicious cycle of poverty, trauma and addiction. They don't care for the political games that are often played with their lives and their lives of their loved ones. They don't care whether governments at Carlton Hill or Whitehall hold specific powers. Most worryingly, they perceive those of us in positions of power as being aloof and devoid of compassion or empathy for the plight they endure. And they fear that we are more interested in point scoring than addressing the root causes of the problem. 
Based on the evidence of the past few years and from what we have heard so far in today's debate, who could really blame them for holding those cynical views? As I said previously, harm reduction and recovery don't exist in their own individual silos. That is a false dichotomy. You can't rehabilitate a corpse and you can't expect harm reduction methods to work without long-term wraparound recovery and addiction services. The harsh reality is that this government have taken their eye off the ball, not my words, but the words of the former First Minister. And in doing so, we have seen an almost continuous spiral of death and devastation in some of the poorest communities in our country. We see those looking to access recovery services failed by a flailing approach to the introduction of MAT standards, an introduction that has been woefully inadequate, caused in part by almost £50 million being slashed from ADP budgets between 2014 and 2019. Happy to give way to the Brian Whittle. I'm very grateful to Paul Sweeney for giving way. I think you know, he, he knows that we all agree in here that we need to take a health approach to addiction. But part of that has to be surely that when those seek help, there has to be somewhere that we can, we can send them to. And that is one of the big issues we have in this country. Paul Sweeney. I completely agree with the point the member makes. One of the most important things of having overdose prevention was that interaction with people who are deeply alienated from other services. That first conversation could be the difference between life and death. And we see that amongst all sorts of different interactions with people who are really vulnerable in society. One of the opportunities this government has is to enhance diamorphine-assisted treatment, for example. We have seen no progression beyond the initial heroin-assisted treatment pilot in Glasgow, something this government has simply not addressed robustly enough that could save lives. The member makes an important point in that regard. And all the while, this government's answer is just to cry out for more powers when every power and policy they have at their disposal, as illustrated previously, is underutilised, underfunded or utterly underwhelming. Yes. I support a public health approach to solving the drug death crisis in our communities. I support harm reduction measures and I support any effort to get people into recovery and rehabilitation should they wish to do so. But what I cannot support, Deputy Presiding Officer, is this government's continued denial of reality and their continued persistence at playing politics with vulnerable people's lives. There are countless people who have made more impact in the fight to solve this country's drug deaths than the Scottish ministers. And I genuinely have nothing but admiration for every single one of those citizens who have stepped forward when the government didn't. They are the real heroes. They are the very best of us. And when they are the ones who showed the leadership and courage when the government was in hiding. I encourage all colleagues to support the amendment in the name of my friend, the member for Dumbarton. Thank you, Mr Sweeney. I now call John Mason to be followed by Gillian Mackay uh, around six minutes. Mr Mason. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. In the first place, I would say I'm pretty well in complete agreement with the motion before us today. Every life lost through drugs is a tragedy. Often, if not in every case, there will be a whole personal story behind someone being currently addicted to drugs. That might have started with financial or relationship problems. That led to alcohol abuse, then on to softer drugs, and finally on to harder drugs, which too often are leading to a tragic death. So is every drug death avoidable? I don't know. If someone had intervened at one of the earlier stages or even during the last stage, then hopefully the end would have been different. But I do feel that some individuals are on such a path of addiction that it is almost impossible to break into the cycle. I had a friend like that with alcohol. He got a huge amount of support, but in the end he destroyed himself. So of course we need to do all we can to help and improve things, but we should never completely rule out individual responsibility. Drug deaths in 2022 were 1,051, and we absolutely want to reduce that. However, it is worth noting at the same time that deaths related to alcohol were higher at 1,276. On the question of a pilot safer drug consumption room, which is widely expected to be in my constituency, I am positive about that. Clearly, anything like this pilot, which will give more support and reduce the number of deaths, is to be welcomed. Hopefully, there would also be a range of other services available on site so that these underlying or associated problems can also be tackled, be that debt, homelessness, mental health, or whatever. At the same time, there are some questions to be addressed. Are the users of the room still expected to buy their drugs illegally? It strikes me as slightly odd that we are to treat 
drug use as a health matter, but the drugs in question are still to be supplied by organised criminal gangs. What other part of the health service requires patients to buy their drugs in this way? Heroin-assisted treatment or medically-assisted treatment do strike me as a better option where possible, with the drugs, required drugs also supplied by the health centre. Because let, let's remember that not all the deaths around drugs are suffered by the people consuming the drugs. We have had various shootings and murders over the years in the east end of Glasgow linked to criminal gangs, which we understand in turn are linked to the supply of drugs. So as long as the supply of these drugs remains in criminal hands, I fear we will continue to experience such violence and death. Uh, yes? Paul Sweeney. I thank the member for giving away on that point. He, may, he will be aware of the, the heroin assisted treatment pilot. I, th I believe it is in his constituency in Glasgow. Um, but does not share my frustration that it is vanishingly small in scale and could be easily uh, expanded and grown in size that would help address some of that issue that you refer to about the criminal gang's monopoly on the supply chain. John Mason. Well, I, I agree with the first half of that, but maybe not the second half. He says it could be easily expanded. Now, I have raised that before with, uh, I can't remember if it was the current minister or previous ministers, and I think there were certain challenges. So I do accept it's not going to apply to everybody, uh, but I would like to see it expanded uh, in due course as we move forward. And I think it has to be, we have to treat each person separately, so it's not maybe suitable for absolutely everybody. But we also know that those needing drugs may steal, supply others, uh, to, uh, or force partners into selling sex in order to fund their habit. Secondly, at a more local level, we already have a fair amount of dealing and using around Hunter Street, Bell Street and East Campbell Street, eh, which for those who are less familiar with the area is just north of the Barras. Over the years, I've had various issues linked to drugs raised by local businesses and local residents. A supermarket had to remove advertising boards because the drugs were being hidden inside them. A shop for young families has had people running through with blood running down their arms and similar. Residents regularly find needles and paraphernalia in their closes and back courts. Now, hopefully some of this will be helped by the consumption room, but will it also attract dealers and users into the area? Thirdly, previously the police had raised the question of how they were to treat people carrying drugs who were travelling from the place of purchase to the consumption rooms. And I'm assuming that this is being dealt with at a higher level through appropriate guidance. And fourthly and finally, I'm broadly pleased that possession of drugs within the facility will not lead to prosecution and that the UK government appears not to be challenging that. However, it does raise a slight concern in my mind about the way this is happening. It does seem that the Lord Advocate is actually making new law, and that is not normally her role. It should be for Parliament, either ourselves or Westminster, to be making the law. We see in countries like the United States and Israel real struggles at the moment as to whether the courts or the elected representatives make the law. So while I'm relaxed on this occasion with Dorothy Bain's intervention, I would not want it to become a regular occurrence for parliamentarians and the existing law to be overruled. On the Conservative Amendment and their plans for a right to recovery, I was just wondering if we have seen any costings for that, eh, how much money it is expected to cost and where that money will be coming from. And to finish on a positive note, there are a variety of ways that people using drugs and other substances can be helped. For some, it will be through gradual reduction in safe consumption rooms or elsewhere. But for others, it can be through abstinence or a quicker break. Just along from my office at Parkhead, there was the base of Carlton Athletic, which was a tremendous project founded by a guy called Davy Bryce. His emphasis was in getting younger guys with addiction issues into sport, and it certainly seemed to work for a number of individuals. And then the other week at Time for Reflection, we heard from Alistair Bennett of Bethany Trust here in Edinburgh. He told of a young man called Scott who grew up near Leith. He fell into a bad rut and lost his way, made some big mistakes, and damaging his mind through a cocktail of substance abuse. By the age of 19, he was in a vice-like paranoia gripping his mind. Alistair told us that actually uh, someone was praying for that uh, person, Scott, his mother, and eventually his life was turned around and his mind was healed. He also told us that the young man was himself. He reminded us that change is possible. Cycles of addiction can be broken. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Mason. I now call Gillian Mackay, who joins us remotely, to be followed by Bill Kidd. Around six minutes, Ms Mackay. 
Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Before I begin, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'd like to apologise for not being in the chamber this afternoon as I too am ill and would like to invite Sue Webber to apologise for her insensitive and incorrect comments earlier. And I quote, the Greens haven't even bothered to turn up. I'm more than happy to take an intervention if she would like to correct the record or apologise. If not, I'll move on. Like many others, I would like to offer my condolences to everyone who's lost a loved one to drugs and to pay tribute to those organisations and individuals who've campaigned tirelessly for drug law reform. I also want to thank those who've provided briefings for today's debate. The Scottish Greens have long called for a public health approach to drug-related deaths. We need to offer support, not judgment, compassion, not punishment. Punishing people for their addiction simply does not work, but it serves to further entrench stigma and prevent people from seeking health. help. As others have mentioned, 1,051 people died in 2022 due to drug-related causes. That is 1,051 preventable deaths, 1,051 grieving families and 1,051 devastated communities. While any reduction in deaths is of course welcome, we still have so far to go. We need to be using every tool in our arsenal to reduce harm and prevent further loss of life. Any harm reduction strategy must include safe consumption rooms and I'm pleased to see the progress that's being made on this, including the Lord Advocate statement last week. It has come not a moment too soon, however. Safe consumption rooms have been operating in Europe for around 30 years. We know they reduce the risk of overdose and can put people who use drugs in touch with services that can help them. They also reduce the risk of disease transmission and the prevalence of discarded needles, and their introduction is long overdue. When it comes to reducing drug-related deaths, we must follow the evidence, but too often progress is blocked by outdated legislation that aims to criminalise people for their drug use. Deputy Presiding Officer, the misuse of Drugs Act 1971 is hugely outdated. As we know, last month, the House of Commons Home Affairs Committee published a report which concluded that the misuse of Drugs Act 1971 and misuse of drugs regulations needed to be updated to support greater use of public health-based drug interventions. The evidence is stacking up, and as more and more voices call for the legislation to be updated. The Royal College of Physicians, the Global Commission of Drug Policy and LEAP UK, among many, are calling for this change too. I wholeheartedly agree with the contents of the motion, that the Scottish Government must work constructively with the UK Government on this or the powers should be devolved. Scotland needs drug legislation that's fit for the 21st century. Legislation that has human rights at its heart. Introducing new legislation will have many benefits, not least allowing the rollout of safe consumption rooms across Scotland. It will also facilitate the rollout of other important public health measures, such as heroin-assisted treatment and drug testing. Scotland's already made progress on heroin-assisted treatment. A dedicated service, as we've already heard, has been allowed to operate by the Home Office in Glasgow. The Scottish Drugs Forum has already reported impressive early results of the programme and the Scottish Greens fully support facilities being opened in other parts of Scotland where people could benefit. We have to see drug checking progress at pace to ensure that people are not injecting drugs cut with, for example, cement. It also allows people to know the strength of what they're injecting and again, that alone could save lives. I now want to focus on stigma. Stigma kills presiding officer. It prevents people from seeking treatment and means they're too seldom met with the kindness and compassion they deserve when they do ask for help. Too often media narratives or those in the chamber focus on personal or lifestyle choices which serve to demonise other people who use drugs. These narratives ignore the fact that Scotland's high levels of drugs, drug use are rooted in the harsh climate of deindustrialisation in the 1980s, which devastated communities across the country. Drug use is often inextric inextricably linked with issues such as poverty, multi-generational trauma and poor, me poor mental health. People with high-risk drug use mainly come from already marginalised communities. Despite this, the Drug Deaths Task Force identified that people are often reduced to a drug problem when they come into contact with services. They need a person-centred system that recognises their multiple and complex needs and the ways that they are variously stigmatised and marginalised, but does not reduce them to categories or labels. 
I've long advocated for stigma training for all of those working in frontline services, and I think that should extend to MSPs too. A first step in building a better, more caring system is ensuring it's underpinned by good quality legislation, which is based on the principle that people who use drugs are individuals who deserve to have their needs met. New drugs legislation will help to tackle stigma. As I said in the beginning of my speech, drug-related deaths should be treated as a public health issue, not a criminal issue. The Greens therefore believe that drug use should ultimately be decriminalised in Scotland, and we will always call on the UK government to engage constructively on this issue, but in the absence of any action from Westminster, powers must be devolved to Scotland so we can create a society where no one is criminalised, stigmatised, marginalised or demonised for their drug use. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Mackay. Can I just take the opportunity to remind members that in debates, the, if you're participating in the debate, you should be here for the opening and the closing speeches. And if you've made a speech, uh, you're expected to remain in for at least two speeches after uh, your own. There have been a couple of members who I think have uh, fallen short of that. So um, just a useful reminder. And I call Bill Kidd uh, to be followed by Brian Whittle uh, for around six minutes. Uh, Mr Kidd. Yes, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I feel that there's much agreement across the Chamber today in as much as a shared recognition of the need for drug law reform. And I welcome the Scottish Labour Party's support for a pilot safer drug consumption room in Glasgow to go ahead contained within their amendment and also agree with their regret that it has taken so long to get to this point since the initial proposal was put forward. However, I think it's worth remembering that only until very recently the UK Government has opposed the introduction of safe consumption rooms at every turn and indeed when the debate on the issue in Westminster Hall was brought forward by my SNP colleague uh, Ronnie Cowan MP calling on the UK Government to look at the growing body of evidence and change the law to allow DCRS to be opened in the UK without fear of prosecution, Victoria Atkins, the Parliamentary Under Secretary at the Home, UK Home Office, said in reply, to be very clear from the start, the Government does not agree with the Honourable Gentleman's suggestion. We have no intention of introducing drug consumption rooms, nor do we have any intention of devolving the UK Government uh, Kingdom policy um, on drug classification and the way in which we deal with the prohibited drugs to Scotland. Following the debate, David Liddell, Chief Executive Officer of the Scottish Drugs Forum, said that it's a clear indication that the current UK Government is not willing to engage in a potentially life-saving and significantly evidence-based approach which would provide another tool in attempting to combat uh, the increasing numbers of drug-related deaths and drug-related infections. Yes. Uh, Michael Mann. I appreciate the member uh, giving way, and, I, and I, I, I do agree with him that it's a good thing that we have reached th this point. Can, perhaps he could tell us and tell the Chamber what it is that he wants to do now that would require the further devolution of, uh, of, of powers. What, what is the policy he wants to implement that he's currently being prevented from doing? Bill Kidd. Thank you very much for that. Um, well, I'm coming to that, and I'll try and cover it anyway, sort of thing, OK? Um, I would point to the last minute about turn. Uh, by the UK Government and the Scottish Secretary's less than substantially supportive statement that they wouldn't intervene, um, which is, of course, a welcome. And I support the sentiments that the Scottish Government should prepare now for a network of safer consumption facilities so that there is no delay in making these life-saving services available around the country. So uh, I think that we have to look at what has been said from Westminster and the Scottish Government, I believe, should be working in a spirit of cooperation um, and hopefully Westminster would do so too. And I'd be keen to hear from the Minister how the Scottish Government intends to approach national um, rollout of these facilities. Um, however, as I said before, I must disagree with the assertion that where we find ourselves is not, as has been stated, the product of a deficiency of devolution. It's precisely because of the deficiencies in devolution that we've been unable to take forward such an approach to reforming drug law here in Scotland, and not only because of the reserved nature of drug law, but more pertinently, more importantly, a lack of willingness on the part of the UK Government to work together with the Scottish Government, an approach we sadly see time and again. However, I believe that that may possibly be able to change. I'm certainly hopeful. Um, turning to the Scottish Conservative Party's proposed amendment, there is much 
again, that I can agree upon, but I can't support it in its entirety. I feel that to dismiss out of hand consideration of decriminalisation is fairly much a knee-jerk reaction and one that is not entirely helpful to the overall debate. Instead, I support a more measured approach to the issue as stated in the Government motion, which says that supports the call for an urgent review of the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971 to fully align the law with the public health response outlined in the Scottish Government paper, a caring, compassionate and human rights informed drug policy for Scotland, of which decriminalising drugs for personal use is one part. I feel that this is a mature and reflective approach and the way forward. And rather than simply opposing something for the sake of it, we must explore all options available to us in tackling drug misuse in Scotland. Now, I don't want to actually um, go too far off uh, beam here, but the truth of the matter is that we have to remember, um, and it's been mentioned by other members, prohibition um, in America, we all know how much of a failure that was when it came to alcohol. And in actual fact, um, as a boy, I remember um, that there was something which was called sturdy dynamite, um, which was actually just made by people out in their own closes and sold because the stuff in the pubs was considered too expensive for some people. Well, if the stuff is considered too expensive, possibly it's because um, it's very much because you can't afford it, but possibly it's also because it's too dangerous. And I think that we need to ensure there's an opportunity for people to actually receive their uh, drug rehabilitation from um, government sources, um, from pharmacies uh, being allowed to provide this or whatever, or drug consumption centres, rather than them buying it from the criminals out in the street. So taking all that into consideration, presiding officer, for the reasons pointed out, um, I won't be supporting the amendments to the Scottish Government's motion, um, but I would actually ask everyone to give wholehearted support to the today's motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Kidd. I now call Brian Whittle to be followed by Jackie Dunbar in six minutes. Mr Whittle. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And, and in my contribution today, I wanted to listen to others across the chamber this afternoon and what I found is there's many of the same people who have been speaking on this issue for the seven years that I've been here. And there has been that consistency of call for the Scottish Government to take action you know, on a crisis that has been growing for many years. And every debate that we have rehearsed repeatedly in this chamber, the Scottish Government have never once managed to answer a question which I continually put, why is Scotland so much worse than everywhere else? And linked to that, would be why Scotland has a higher death rate among the homeless community. Can, how can you deliver a solution to a problem that you don't actually understand? Now, the previous uh, Minister, Angela Constance, herself said during a question session with the Health and Sport Committee that it will require the deployment of resource from both the health and education portfolios to effectively tackle this crisis. And she is absolutely correct. And both of these portfolios are totally devolved to the Scottish Government. So what we... Of course. Audrey Nicholl. I'm just wanting to ask the member if he's aware of the cross-committee work that is ongoing uh, in the Scottish Parliament involving the criminal justice, social justice and health committees. Um, that are looking together uh, at how we support the work around tackling drug harm and reducing drug deaths in Scotland. Brian Wood. Uh, can, I, can I thank the member for intervention? I'm going to go on to the way in which not, not only do, should we work in cross-portfolio, but we should be working with Westminster, as we did do in the last, in the last session. Hopefully that will that'll, that'll answer our question. What I'd like to, to go on to is what we, what we could be doing and what we should have been doing. We have called, Scottish Conservatives have called for the reintroduction of rehabilitation beds for years, and uh, after the SNP government decimated the available numbers, and only now the Scottish government uh, reversing those cuts. And I would like to see an increase in needle exchange programme to tackle HIV and hepatitis C, reversing the upward trend after these programmes again were cut. And how do we deal with the reoffending in our jail system? How do we put support into prisons where too many actually become addicted to these drugs? And how do we link that support 
once they leave prison. And this brings me to my point around the third sector, something that I have championed many, uh, for many years in here. The third sector are absolutely crucial in tackling the drug death crisis and we have to make sure they are properly funded because I don't know about the members in here, but every, every third sector organisation I talk to uh, in this, this particular issue are struggling with funding. And they are the people that are reached the, the most disenfranchised in our communities. And I've been particularly interested in the link between deprivation and addiction. And to Audrey Nichols' point here, I, I joined the Westminster Scottish Affairs Committee investigation into Scotland's drug problem, along with other colleagues from the Health and Sport Committee. And their report said, and I quote, deprivation itself does not directly cause addiction. The links between poverty and drug misuse are complex. The main mechanisms that are described as credible links between deprivation and problem drug use are weak family bonds, physical discomfort and personal distress, including ACEs and long-term distress. And I have to say it is quite remarkable, the link between childhood um, ACEs and, and drug misuse low employment opportunities and few community resources. And once someone has a drug problem, they also have more limited means to escape poverty. The chances of obtaining paid employment is also much reduced. Having a criminal record, a lack of an employment history and the stigma of having or having had a substance abuse will all play a part in this. So Deputy Presiding Officer, it stands to reason the resource should be allocated prior to addiction. This has to be the most cost-effective investment. Simply put, if there are fewer community resources in these areas, then for goodness sake, develop these resources to fit those communities. Long-term policy on prevention here is required, and it's never, it's never brought up in these, these debates. And that is about access to opportunities, to participate in our communities, to be part of something, the chance to be passionate about something in a group who have the same passions. We need to ensure easier access to these services. One thing is for sure, if we don't give our children a gang to belong to, they will find their own gang. And I'm afraid to say that decriminalisation does nothing to address this issue. Now, I will say I have the greatest respect for Ellen McWhittam and her knowledge in this issue, not to mention her commitment to tackling this crisis. But I have to ask the question why it's taken the Scottish Government so long to act. Now I looked at a motion, the one I mentioned uh, early on in an intervention to Alex Cole Ham Hamilton, the debate in March 2021, one that the whole parliament voted for because we needed to move this debate on. Despite our continuing concern over safe consumption, consumption rooms, and mine is that if we spend the money in consumption room, what other solutions will have to be ditched? And that motion mirrors the current government motion, a new set of MSPs and the reset button is hit once again. What progress have we made in the last two and a half years? And it reminds me of a, a, a line from those on the front line that said, you keep talking and we keep dying. All the while, there are those in our society who are the most marginalised, whose voices are seldom heard, who desperately need our help, and who are continually overlooked and let down by this place. Quite frankly, that is this Parliament's shame, and more specifically, SNP government's shame, whose actions have been too little and too late. Minister, you have the support of the whole chamber to get this crisis under some kind of control. And I would ask that you and your government depoliticise this, get rid of the constitutional argument and recognise you have all the powers you need to deliver a solution. Look at the Conservatives' right to recover the bill and implement a more rounded approach. This will not be solved by the odd safe consumption room and certainly not by the decriminalisation of drugs. Education and health policy the real battlegrounds, where the real hard yards will have to be made. Please don't be afraid of making long, uh, difficult long-term decisions. This is the only way to deal with this crisis, because, Deputy Presiding Officer, looking back at some of the debates just in my time here shows us that precious little has changed, and it needs to, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you. I now call Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Michael Mara uh, around six minutes. Ms Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. And can I first of all wish the Minister and Gillian Mackay a speedy recovery and thank them for um, leaving their sick beds this afternoon to, to enter into the debate. I have said it before in this chamber and I will say it again. Every drug death is a tragedy. Every statistic represents not just a person, but grieving friends, family and community. The high levels of drug deaths we face year on year in both the UK and Scotland 
show that the current approach is just not working. And as such, I and many others welcome the evidence-based proposals for change and reform. If we are to address the root cause of the drugs death tra tragedy, we need to tackle the issues of stigma and dehumanisation. The, stigma the stigmatisation of drug misuse means we often dehumanise these folks, and we simply cannot allow this to be the case if we are to see serious positive change. These are real folk with real friends and families. They are among my constituents, they're amongst your constituents, they're among all our constituents. And if we want to create a society where drug misuse is treated as a health issue and not a criminal matter, then we must work to actively unlearn and remove dehumanisation from our work, as we know it has tragic consequences. We must create a supportive environment where users can reach out for help and know they will receive it without judgment or discrimination, and where we work to identify and remove, remove social, cultural and economic barriers to help. And we are taking a significant step in that journey through approaching this now as a public health emergency. Ultimately, substance dependency is a health condition, and when it takes root in our communities, it should be dealt with first and foremost as an avoidable public health emergency, not just as a regrettable uptick in criminal activity. That is why I was so heartened to see this principle at the heart of the Scottish Government's motion today, and it is hugely reassuring to see it right there in the title of the policy paper itself, a caring, compassionate and human rights informed drug policy for Scotland. The more we embed compassion into our approach to this emergency and the more awareness we spread of the human right to a happy, healthy life, the more folk with a dependency on drugs will then be able to seek the caring and often life-saving support to which we are entitled. Of course, it's not just enough to be kind and hope for the best, which is why the policy paper contains bold ideas as well building on the policies and investment already in place. The £250 million national mission on drugs must continue to gain momentum, ensuring the right treatment is re reaching the right people. Residential rehabilitation must be accessible. Life-saving MET standards must be delivered. And the effort to tackle interconnected issues of social justice and inequality must continue. Those living in the most deprived areas of Scotland are almost 16 times more likely to die from drug misuse. So I welcome the First Minister's laser focus on eradicating poverty in the year ahead, and I applaud this wholeheartedly. But more is needed, and the Scottish Government's drug policy shows a promising route ahead. The policy proposal that captured the most headlines was arguing for decriminalisation of possession for personal supply. It is seen as a radical policy, but less radical than may once have been the case. We have evidence of its effectiveness, not just in projections and theories, but in reality. We just need to look to Portugal for proof, where they introduced a similar policy in 2001, policy that remains to this day. And like us today, they recognise the fight had to be against the health problem, not the patients. And the paper states support for safer drug consumption rooms, noting that 16 countries successfully operate legal drug consumption rooms as of 2022. The recent announcement by the Lord Advocate will have been welcome news to many who are keen to see progress, progress with us. So long as care, compassion and human rights are at the core of the Scottish Government's approach, I have hope that we can turn the tide saving lives and improving folks' well-being. It is harder to maintain that hope when I look at the approach of the UK Government. And while we turn to care, compassion and human rights, the Home Office claims to be swift, certain and tough. This was the title of a UK Government paper just last year. It's entirely outdated, dehumanising and stigmatising language. And it's a hangover from the impossible war on drugs a war that cannot be won and a war we cannot keep fighting. The Reserve Misuse of Drugs Act 1971 is now over 50 years old. It is in urgent need of reform and it is not just here in the Scottish Parliament that this is recognised. 
Experts on the Drug Deaths Task Force have come to the same conclusion, as have Westminster Scottish Affairs Committee and Health and Social Care Committee. Only by amending the Misuse of Drugs Act or devolving the powers to implement Scotland's drug policy can we reach the end goal, saving lives, preventing harm and removing needless stigmas. The changes outlined in the Scottish Government's proposals, while ambitious and radical, are also necessary. And it has been said many times across and out with this chamber that we are facing an emergency. In the face of crisis, you use every lever at your disposal. And in this case, some of these levers currently lie with the UK Government. My hope is that the talks ahead are constructive and positive, and that care and compassion guide our national mission to end drug deaths for good. Thank you, Ms. Dunbar. I now call Michael Mara to be followed by Audrey Nicholl for around six minutes, Mr. Mara. Thank you, President Officer. This is a moment when years of excuses, of obfuscation and prevarication should finally come to an end. The Lord Advocate's statement, meaning a trial of safe consumption rooms in Scotland can now proceed, is long on overdue and long predicted. There have been significant legal voices saying for years that there was no barrier in law to a competent proposal of this kind proceeding and that the question was one of Scottish Government competence and political will. It should never have taken this long. In 2017, the then Lord Advocate ruled against an incompetent proposal from this Government and in the years since they have indulged in constitutional grievances in an attempt to shift the blame. In 2018, then Public Health Minister Joe Fitzpatrick, MSP, described safe consumption rooms as a policy that will save lives, but claimed it was Westminster who prevented them from being tested here. The SNP government proclaimed itself powerless to act. Mr Fitzpatrick said in November 2019, I just do not understand how the UK government can stand in the way of saving lives. How many of the 296 recorded drug deaths in Dundee from 2017 to now could have been avoided? if action had been taken by ministers in the Scottish Government. The most recent UK-wide data shows that Scottish drug deaths in 2021 were almost three times higher than the UK average. That is a deeply inconvenient truth for this Government that has admitted to taking their eye off the ball. It is a truth that should have given ministers pause before tabling motions such as the one we have in front of us today, and rightly criticised by my colleagues Jackie Bailey and Paul Sweeney. This really matters. Because admitting to gross failures in this government's policy agenda can help Scotland avoid such mistakes again. There has never been any answer from this government, as I highlighted to Ben McPherson, on who approved that Valium scripts be withdrawn back in 2014, seeding a market in illicit benzodiazepines that have been implicated in thousands of lost lives in Scotland. Policy failure in this area, certainly. Minister. So, just for the record, um, on the issue of a decision being taken to stop prescribing benzodiazepines in Scotland, that was not a decision taken by any government. It was a clinical decision based on research that showed a risk of harm from prescribing benzodiazepines. And crucially, it was a UK-wide trend. It wasn't just a Scottish thing. Now, the Scottish Government will publish the results of its recent consultation on prescribing benzodiazepines, and this will include guidelines on safe prescribing, and that publication is scheduled later this year. Just for the record, because there's been a couple of interventions misinforming on this issue. Michael Murray, I can give you the time. I, I thank, I thank uh, the, the, the Minister for the intervention. I have to say that I have asked time and again for an explanation in this chamber and elsewhere as to the process around it, and it has never been forthcoming. And I would say that if there is minutes that can be provided of a national prescribing decision that was taken, because it was a national pro approach rather than an individual approach taken by clinicians, it was taken across the whole of the country. So I appreciate that that information could be published, if you have it in front of you now, so that parliamentarians could see the basis of the decision that was taken. No, thank you, sir. It was clearly a decision that has resulted in thousands of lives being lost in this country. There have been perverse consequences from it, certainly. Minister. Certainly. I can attempt to furnish you with that information, but I can assure Please you... Please through the chair. So, I certainly can attempt to furnish the member with that information. I don't think there was a decision taken mm. by government to reduce the prescription of benzodiazepine prescribing in Scotland in particular. I can assure the member and everyone will be aware I'm a registered pharmacist. 
and I am specialised in mental health for 20 years. There is a body of evidence which shows the clinical challenges associated with prescribing benzodiazepines, and I think the member is misleading the chamber by trying to imply that is a peculiar situation in Scotland. That is something which raises concern throughout the world. Michael Mara. If I can have the time back, sign off, sir, I would greatly appreciate it. I, would, I, have to, I have to say to the Minister that the, actual, the, the drug death figures since then absolutely show a complete departure from the UK pattern and the Scottish pattern. And within the, the, the toxicology reports that are uh, ascribed to those deaths, there's a massive increase in gabapentin, um, etizolam, uh, illicit street uh, uh, drugs, as a result of these scripts being withdrawn. Now, I can, I can, I can like the Minister, I'm happy to engage with her on a future basis on, on this point, because this, frankly, is the most engaged that I've had a government minister on this point, and I've been raising it for two and a half years. So I'll be a welcome further dialogue on it, because it's absolutely essential that we learn where the mistakes have been made. And this has been a grotesque mistake. It has resulted in deaths, and the figures prove that to be the case. So the, the policy failure in this area are measured in deaths. There's no doubt about that. And they must now set aside this government, the default constitutional arguments, and set out clearly and fully. When will the MAT standards be met? Now 18 months overdue. When will they be fully implemented? Can the Minister provide guarantees that the safe consumption pilot in Glasgow will be fully funded and that the budget disaster in Glasgow's health and social care partnership will not affect that? Will this include research to prove the direct and indirect impacts of the intervention so that people can have confidence in any potential rollout? What progress is being made on drug checking pilot proposed for Dundee, and I've had a promise for that uh, from the, uh, Minister Whittam today, which is uh, welcome, but we need to make sure that we can build on that health messaging and the development of accurate data. And I do remain deeply concerned, President Officer, in the statement last week and in the government speeches today, the government still does not have a firm grasp of what is actually going on behind the top-line statistics. The drop in drug deaths for 2022 was welcome, but does the government actually know why it has happened? Last week in the Chamber, I raised with Ministers reports I'm hearing from drug workers and campaigners in Dundee of a very significant rise in the use of crack cocaine. The impacts of this drug on people's behaviours, on their relationships and wider communities are severe and destabilising. The Minister told me in the Chamber last week that services in Dundee must pivot to the new challenges presented by changes in drug use. But the complete failure of service reform in my home city has been the subject of multiple damning reports and has led to the resignation of the independent chair of the Alcohol and Drug Partnership. The last decade of inertia and blame shifting does not give me any confidence that the systems we have are agile, dynamic and ready to respond. Very, very far from it. So I am grateful, President Officer, to the Minister for offering to meet with me and discuss this particular issue in greater depth. I hope the Minister can commit to publishing any information the Government has on the trends in drug use in Dundee and across Scotland. This data is crucial in ensuring the months and years ahead are not yet more wasted time, time which the people of Dundee simply cannot afford to lose, and we, as their representatives in this Parliament, must not allow to be squandered. Thank you, Mr Mara. I now call uh, Audrey Nicholl to be followed by Annie Wells, around six minutes. Uh, Ms Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I echo the comments made by colleagues this afternoon. Every life lost to drug use is a tragedy for loved ones, friends and communities left behind. I welcome the opportunity to speak in today's debate in support of the government motion that recognises the scale of the job in hand to reduce drug harm, how our approach in Scotland is being developed and what more is required. And I want to thank um, the organisations who submitted briefings ahead of the debate today. No one is in any doubt whatsoever that despite the overall reduction in deaths recorded as drug related, the scale of the challenge to meaningfully address drug harm is long-term, complex and cross-cutting. Chronic and multiple complex disadvantage, poor physical and mental health, unstable housing, family breakdown can predispose people to high-risk drug use. Deprivation, ageing population of people who use or have used drugs and the risky behaviours of some people who use drugs, all complex in their own right, never mind trying to address them collectively across communities, sectors and organisations. 
In recent years, the suite of measures launched to tackle the drug death crisis in Scotland and deriving from the work of the Scottish Drug Death Task Force has gained traction with two basic principles underpinning this work. Firstly, that drug-related deaths are preventable, and we've heard much about that in the Chamber this afternoon. And Scotland uh, and the Scottish Government uh, must focus on what can be done within our powers. The National Mission has underpinned much of this work across Scotland to support better access to treatment, improve frontline drug services, and increase access to residential rehabilitation. And I am particularly pleased to note the increased funding to community and grassroots organisations and that practice involving work with families has developed further. And this is a point that Brian Whittle made. Um, this front-facing work sits at the heart of how we make life better for families and individuals impacted by drug harm. But it's also a very important eyes and ears uh, in terms of the point that uh, Michael Mara uh, uh, alluded to uh, in and around uh, changing patterns of drug use. However, I know from engagement with colleagues supporting the delivery uh, of drug services in the North East that while the national mission has been welcomed, uh, the, wider use, sorry, the wider issue of funding arrangements risks impacting on the effectiveness of workforce planning. So, given that we all must be invested in maintaining the momentum of this work, uh, I would be keen to engage further with the Minister on this particular point. I very much welcome the recent Scottish Government paper, A Caring, Compassionate and Human Rights Informed Drug Policy for Scotland, that members have alluded to this afternoon and that sets out a new way of developing our drugs laws based on evidence and informed by those living with drug harm and those working to alleviate drug harm. And in this regard, I want to make reference to the work of the Parliament's cross-committee uh, work on tackling drug harm and reducing drugs deaths. This followed on from an evidence session that the Criminal Justice Committee held with people with lived experience of drug use. And they told us very clearly that they wanted to see a cross-sector approach to tackling this issue. And in response to this, members of the Criminal Justice, Health, Social Care and Sport and Social Justice and Social Security Committees agreed to meet jointly. Our remit is to consider the implementation of the recommendations of the Scottish Drugs Deaths Task Force. And I know the Minister was involved in the early stages uh, of this work while she was convener of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee. This approach reflects the need to consider aspects of the criminal justice system, as well as health policies and wider social and economic matters, such as poverty, unemployment, uh, unstable housing uh, and family breakdown that we have discussed earlier in the chamber. And members have met jointly four times since uh, February 2022. And Isabel. Sue Webber. Thank you, presiding officer. Yes, I'm, I'm, I take part in these joint committees and I find them extremely useful. But like you, I had to plead for the health committee to take the lead for this next joint committee on the Tuesday. And you have, as a as convener, through the, through the chair, as convener of the criminal justice, have given much time to this joint committee. Like you, like me, are you not delighted that we are now using the time of the health committee? Audrey Nicholl, I can give you the time back. I, I, I thank the member for her intervention, and, I, and I'm pleased to hear her positive remarks about the cross committee work. You know, the spirit of this work is to approach this uh, cross-cutting issues in a more appropriate uh, and collegiate way. Uh, and I'm uh, very happy for the, member, uh, uh, for the member's committee uh, to take the lead at the next uh, meeting. So an issue we considered from the outset was how to progress the establishment of safer 
drugs consumption rooms in Scotland. And ahead of our meeting next week, we asked the Lord Advocate if she could provide an update on her consideration of a pilot of a safer drugs consumption facility in Glasgow. And the Minister helpfully outlined the Lord Advocate's commitment to this in her response to Jackie Bailey's uh, intervention. And in her response to the cross-committee members, the Lord Advocate indicated that she, and I quote, would be prepared to publish a statement of prosecution policy to the effect that it would not be in the public interest to prosecute users of that facility in terms of Section 5.2 of the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971 for simple possession offences committed within the confines of the facility. And this is greatly welcome and paves the way towards the development of a pilot for a drug consumption room service in Glasgow, particularly given the, that Glasgow City has seen the highest rate of drugs deaths uh, for the last five years. And I have to say this approach is a far cry from the UK government white paper, Swift Certain Tough New Consequences for Drug Possession, that Ms. aims Ms. to Ms. escalate ask you to conclude, penalties please. for so-called recreational drug users in England and Wales. So to conclude, I urge members to support the government motion this afternoon, and I look forward to monitoring progress across Scotland. Thank you. And I call Annie Wells to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I have personally seen what addiction does to those we care about, <clears throat> and I have experienced losses in my own life because of it. This is an issue that deserves to be treated as a national emergency. It has deserved to be treated that way for more than a decade. Shamefully, the SNP are once again solely looking to play politics with this, with this issue. They are looking to deflect blame away from their awful record and they are trying to create a constitutional grievance instead of working together to save lives. They should be working with the UK government instead. All they are doing is trying to fight them. The SNP's demand for decriminalisation is purely an attempt to create a grievance with the UK government. They are just... Can you make some progress? Thank you. They are just trying to find an excuse so they can blame Westminster for a problem that the SNP created. They are completely dodging responsibility and accountability, so let me remind them of the facts. Since the SNP came to power, drug deaths have reached, had reached increased record levels. That is why Nicola Sturgeon admitted she took the eye off the ball on drug deaths. We had the same laws then as now, but drug deaths were far lower. On their watch, Scotland has the worst drug death record problem in Europe. We have one of the worst drug death rates anywhere in the developed world. It did not used to be this way. Before the SNP came to power, this was not the case. And we lose far more people than anywhere else in the UK, despite having the exact same laws. Has anyone in government thought to ask themselves why that is? The problem, presiding officer, is our recovery and treatment options. The SNP cut them several years ago, and the number of deaths increased dramatically. They cut the budget for alcohol and drug partnerships, and lives were lost as a result. They slashed numbers of rehab beds, so thousands of people couldn't get the help that they need. Ever since the SNP took those actions, they have suddenly started talking about consumption rooms and decriminalisation. Before they reduced treatment options, we never heard of those ideas from the SNP. They never suggested them until after they cut budgets and drug deaths increased. They only started suggesting those ideas purely to try and deflect from their own failures. Their motives are so see-through it is utterly shameful. I will take the intervention. Ben McPherson. I th thank Annie Wells for taking the intervention. Uh, does the member ag agree with me that in the period of recent years there have been uh, considerations about drug laws internationally? And it's only right that in Scotland and the UK we also look at the legislation and the services collectively. And in Scotland that means looking at devolved and reserved matters to make sure that we are getting our policies right in order to 
um, make sure that it's harm reduction and people's welfare that are at the forefront of our minds. Annie Wells. I thank the member for the intervention. But what the point I'm trying to make is we've got the same laws here as the rest of the UK, but we've got almost three times more drug deaths here in Scotland. So I don't think we need to go down that route. We need to look and see what more can the SNP government do with the powers that it has. Yeah, I will. Ben McPherson. I thank the member for taking the intervention. I think my point is broader in that I, I, I wonder if the member agrees that the, the whole consideration around these matters and the regulation is something that does actually need to be looked at at Westminster level. Uh, there was an advisory council on the misuse of drugs that was uh, produced very factually based information. Committees at Westminster have looked at it and it, it is right that the Scottish Government is considering these matters in the round and looking at best practice elsewhere. Annie Wells. I thank the member again for that intervention but what I would say to the member is the Scottish Government needs to look at itself and take the responsibility that it has to take now for the largest number of drug deaths in Europe and the developed world. Um, for a few years, the SNP seemed to be accepting some responsibility. Nicola Sturgeon did apologise. She admitted she took the eye, her eye off the ball and she committed to putting money into drug treatment. But what is happening now? Funding for recovery services across Scotland have been subjected to significant funding cuts. The 22-23 budget allocation of the Scottish Government to organisations helping those with addiction was £18.8 million less than it was the previous year. And do you know what, President Officer? It really hurts me to see that treatment services are cut when we have the worst drug death record in Europe. When communities like mine in Springburn are devastated every day, week, month and year by another life lost to addiction. How can they stand here today protesting about powers they don't have when they don't even use the powers they do have? How can they blame anybody else for drug deaths increasing when they cut the treatment budgets? How can they possibly claim they, needed to change, they need to change laws when we didn't used to lose this many people to drugs when we had the exact same laws. Instead of deflecting blame and pursuing a grievance with the UK government, the SNP should be using the powers they have now to their full extent. They could be doing so much more to save lives. They could increase the number of rehab beds. They could cut the length of time that people wait to get into addiction programmes of all kinds. And they could bring in a right to recovery bill to guarantee that everyone can get the treatment they need before it's too late. This policy is backed by frontline organisations, experts and, crucially, presiding officer, families who have lost loved ones to drugs. It is a Scottish Conservative policy, but it is not a typical Conservative centre-right policy. It would enshrine a human rights approach in law, it, would, it is progressive and it would start to save lives immediately. I also urge the SNP Government not only to restore previous levels of funding to organisations helping those with addiction, but to increase funding for, those, for these indispensable services. Scotland can end this national shame, but it will depend on the SNP government accepting responsibility for what is in their control. They must use the powers they have now, not continue to focus on ways to fight the UK government. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. And I call Bob Doris, the final speaker in the open debate. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, before I I comment uh, and give my prepared uh, remarks. C can I say to Annie Wells, I don't think I've got anything remotely party political in my speech here this afternoon, so this is not made remotely in a party political fashion. You mentioned budgets, so Ms Wells mentioned budgets quite a lot. We'll have a budget process in the, this place. I really hope with all sincerity the Conservatives won't just demand more money, but they'll actually work constructively with our Scottish Government to deliver a balanced budget for this place that meets the needs of those living with addiction and in recovery, because up until now that has just simply never happened. And that's just a matter of fact. Now, on to my prepared uh, comments, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to depart in today's debate, which at its heart seeks to embed a public health approach to Scotland's drugs policy. I absolutely do support that approach, of course, and a key aspect to that, not the only aspect to that public health approach, will be the delivery of a pilot for a safer drugs consumption facility. Following the statement on the matter by the Lord Advocate Dorothy Bain KC regarding 
prosecution policy, the roadblock to rolling out the safe drugs consumption facility appears to have been removed. I believe it will be vital to get the maximum level of consensus across all parties over how the delivery of that drugs consumption facility will operate, what supports will be offered over mental health, wider health, housing, welfare, treatment, rehabilitation, wider package of support for the individual and their family. What, will out, what outcomes will be agreed in advance? How will they be monitored? And how will they be reported upon? Political consensus is required. How will we sensitively capture with dignity the voice of those with lived experience who use such a facility, or indeed those who choose not to? Indeed, for those who choose not to or feel unable to, what options and alternatives will be developed for them? That is also part of the learning experience for any pilot. There has been much said uh, uh, this afternoon about the possible decriminalisation of drugs. When the Scottish Government launched a caring, compassionate and human rights and forum drugs policy in Scotland paper, there were many people and organisations who welcomed this, and there were others who heard decriminalisation and thought legalisation. And that has to be a concern. Decriminalising the possession for personal uh, supply and use is part of a wider, and it must be part of a wider review of drug laws, I believe, on balance, is the right thing to do. But we need to be clear what we mean by decriminalisation. We need to be clear about what support will be available for those found in possession of Class A drugs. Decriminalisation is not a free pass. It has to be part of a wider public health approach that we're talking about this afternoon. Harm reduction, rehabilitation, recovery. I think Mr Sweeney said the whole systems approach during his contribution. Russell finally made some uh, comments regarding serious and organised crime. Even if I don't agree with his tone or characterisation regarding decriminalisation, Parliament should still engage with such concerns. It can be hugely challenging for Police Scotland to tackle and take down low-level drug dealers at times, let alone those higher up the food chain. We must ensure decriminalisation sees such dealers and the carnage they can cause be increasingly targeted, not tolerated. Decriminalisation can still make that happen. I also want to turn to the need to continue to expand access to rehabilitation services, as well as the right to rehab. If a public health approach is to be at the heart of our approach to our drugs death crisis, then we have to provide the most appropriate treatment. It is not about a right to rehab, it is about a right to the most appropriate treatment. But for many, that will be residential rehabilitation. Do I have time, President Officer? Yeah. Brian Whittle. I'm very grateful uh, to Bob Ross for giving intervention. I'm listening very carefully to what he says. I know he's very considered and how he brings, uh, brings his, 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 his contribution to these debates. I wonder if you agree to me that agree with me that crucial in the delivery of those services are the third sector organisations who are the ones who are most likely to be able to access the most removed from our society and continuing to, to, to cut the budgets of those is going to be counterproductive because we need to make sure that if we're going to give everybody the right to recovery, you need to be able to access the services. Bob Doris. Can I say to Mr Whittle, I agree with the importance of third sector organisations can bring real credibility uh, in support to those living with addiction and those seeking recovery. I would always want to see their budgets increase, and that's something we think we need to look at in the next budget process going forward, Mr Whittle, and I hope we can come together, as I've seen to Ms Wells, as a parliament in relation to do that. Um, so, as I was saying, a public health policy has to be the heart of our approach to treatment also, and the right to the most appropriate treatment, and for some that will be the right to rehab. And it's in that context that who wouldn't support a right to rehab? But we obviously, presiding officer, have to see the details of any bill that comes before this parliament. Now, if I have a little bit of time left, I did want to mention one of those third sector organisations, Cisco, uh, based in Springburn, in my constituency. I'm aware of mentioning them because I haven't said to Natalie Logan I was going to mention them in parliament this afternoon. I don't like doing that, actually, presiding officer. But they've just opened up a, a wonderful facility, facility um, in the old Clydesdale Bank at Springburn Shopping Centre that everyone passing can see. 
public facing. There's a massive banner on the window that talks about helping prisoners build a bridge between prison and the community. They don't shy away that vulnerable people are at the heart of our community and need peer-led support and pathways to recovery and pathways back to productive lives within the community. And it's organisations such as that that are also part of the solution to tackle Scotland's drugs death crisis. Presiding officer, thank you. Thank you. And we move to winding up speeches, and I call on Pauline McNeill. Presiding officer, Scotland has a higher proportion of drug deaths than any other country in Europe. And our fatal drug overdose rate is also the highest in Europe ahead of the population. The Joint Committee on Drug Death Report highlights that this cannot be explained simply by the link between deprivation and drug misuse. And as said by others, each death is a personal tragedy for them, their friends, their families and their communities. But I think we all agree it is a stain on Scotland as a nation. And I believe every single one of those deaths is preventable. I do want to commend all the speeches this afternoon from whatever perspective they come from. But I wanted to mention the speeches of Michael Mara and Annie Wells, because I think they come from passion and representing communities that are blighted by drugs. The introduction of safe consumption rooms is an issue which I've been passionately involved in since 2018. And along with Gillian Mackay and Gillian Martin, we questioned the then UK minister, Kit Malthouse, at the Joint Committee, pointing out that the many countries where drug consumption rooms have saved lives it has made a difference. In fact, I hosted the first meeting in this parliament that discussed safe consumption rooms, and it was thanks to the work of Recovering Justice, hosting the wonderful Nana Godwinson, the Danish street lawyer, who was instrumental in changing the Danish government's policy on this. But I also want to praise the work of my colleague Paul Sweeney and Peter Kaikan on this, who I think have been instrumental in getting a change in policy. Scotland is flagging behind the rest of the UK on tackling drug addiction and overdose, that is clear. The last opportunity, I believe, is to set a path and to know, as Michael Mara said in his contribution, that we can change this for all time. The UK government's uh, first home is open of its licensed drug checking service in Bristol, run by the Loop, a non-profit NGO, is expected to start regular testing in the coming months. The service was approved in early 2022, and the LUT also introduced event-based drug checking in 2016 and community-based drug checking in 2018. A home office pilot drug checking service was also launched in Somerset in 2019, and for mother, furthermore, an online drug checking service funded by the Welsh Government was launched as far back as October 2013. So you can see the work that we have to do to catch up. If England and Wales have been able to establish such facilities, then there's no reason why Scotland shouldn't have these services by now. The Scottish Government has also said in the recent paper, a caring, compassionate and human rights informed drug policy for Scotland, that we should have decriminalisation of possession for personal supply in Scotland. However, as others have said, arguably we have the best approach here in Scotland, due to the Lord Advocate Dorothy Bain QC once again proving to be innovative and responsive in relation to personal use. It was two years ago that the recorded police warning scheme was extended to include Class A drugs. The scheme enables police officers to show how discretion to show discretion and issue a warning instead of char uh, charging an individual for possession where they believe it is appropriate. Uh, the scheme hasn't been in place since 2016, which previously applied to Class B and Class C drugs. So we already have ways in place whereby people suffering from addiction can be diverted where that's appropriate. I wanted to mention the drug court set up in Glasgow in 2003, now been going on for 20 years. And I wonder if the Minister, in summing up, can update Parliament on the rollout of the drugs courts and what uh, how useful drugs courts are in 2023. Uh, however, there's no publicly available data under how the police warning system um, is working effectively. We don't know, for example, how many people with an addiction have received a warning, what services people have been diverted to, or the outcomes have been. So I think it would be wise to have some evaluation to ensure individuals are getting the help that they most desperately need. The powers to end Scotland's drug crisis, I believe, lies here in Scotland and in St Andrew's House in the Scottish Government. 
Uh, this includes powers over our entire health system, our drug treatment services, our mental health services, social care, policing and prisons. As the former head of the Drug Deaths Task Force, Katrina Matheson said, the Scottish Government needs to focus on what we can do now in Scotland without trying to divert attention to Westminster and the Misuse of Drugs Act. It is also worth bearing in mind that areas related to UK-wide legislation are only a small subset of the areas that we need to look at. Uh, on the ground, there is clearly a lot to be done, and this is reflected in the most recent drug death figures and the overdose data. The Scottish Government may truly believe that it is doing everything it can within its powers to deal with the crisis, though through the national mission announced in January 2021 and the £250 million package. However, the true test is in delivery. So I welcome those recent investments for the sector, but as Annie Wells and others have said, the cuts to budgets uh, making a staggering uh, impact on recovery services. The fact that we have a green light for one pilot overdose prevention facility after four years uh, when we're in a public health emergency is very, very telling. And Scotland's drug death crisis is a matter of na national shame. Scottish Labour believes that drug consumption will help as part of a wider picture to tackle the number of facilities to keep people safe. The Lord Advocate's decision will help lay the groundwork for the establishment of a safe consumption room in Glasgow. Um, as John Mason has welcomed, this I will do as well. I just wanted to uh, point out to Parliament that it's important to discuss with those communities and local representatives how it will actually function. I understand that the location in Carlton and Glasgow for the first consumption room there is some concern that it might be a bit isolated with no bus service. Uh, so it's important to have those conversations to make sure that we're doing it, we're doing it correctly. I do think it is important to continue to work cross-party to end the scandal level of drug deaths in Scotland. But ultimately, it is for the Scottish Government who have the powers to lead in the investment they must put in recovery services and be accountable for their decisions. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I call on Sandesh Gohani. I wish to refer members to my register of interest as a practicing NHS GP. Minister Eleanor Whitton states in her motion that the Scottish Government is required to use every lever at its disposal to save and improve lives. But have they? Well, they haven't since the 16th of May 2007, when the SNP took office. And they didn't, even as they watched the upward trend in drug misuse skyrocket from 2013. Now, let's just consider one of the levers the minister speaks of. If the SNP were serious about exploring how to introduce a pilot drug consumption room, we know that they could have done this much earlier. That is, if they really wanted to. We now know they didn't need the UK government to devolve any powers to Holyrood in order to pilot this initiative. So it does make one consider, presiding officer, that the SNP instead preferred to stoke grievance and blame Westminster rather than do something. Perhaps former Health Minister Joe Fitzpatrick would want to correct the record given what Michael Mara told us. Sue Webber reminded us that the Scottish Government have not met their own MAT standards for drugs and also the devastating effect caused by heinous gangs forcing families out of their homes. I thank Jackie Bailey for supporting Douglas Ross's Right to Recovery Bill. I agree with her that this is not a silver bullet, but it is part of the solution to help people get off drugs and alcohol. Colette Stevenson spoke bravely about her own personal experience, and I strongly agree with her, Brian Whittle and Audrey Nicholl, about the amazing role the third sector can and does play. Russell Finley is absolutely correct in saying normalisation of drugs is unforgivable. Which brings me on to Alex Cole Hamilton, who spoke about Portugal, as did many SNP members. The Washington Post in July this year is reporting that police are blaming a spike in the number of people using drugs for a rise in crime, plus overdose rates hitting a 12-year high. Porto's mayor said, and I quote, 
These days in Portugal, it is forbidden to smoke tobacco outside a school or a hospital. It is forbidden to advertise ice cream and sugar candies. And yet, it is allowed for people to be there injecting drugs. We've normalised it. This is not a Scotland I want to see. Sue Webber reminded us that Portland, Oregon decriminalised drugs in 2021, where they actually recorded a sharp rise in overdose deaths and an explosion in crime. Their Public Safety Commissioner has implored Scotland to avoid the tragedy that they are going through. Now, Minister Eleanor Whitten said in her, contribu in her contribution that this experience did not count because this was all they did. But may I remind the Minister that Ballot Measure 110 in Portland also directed marijuana tax dollars for addiction services, which accounted to $265 million. Despite this, they are reversing it. Annie Wells spoke passionately about addictions and went on to say that savage cuts to rehab led to an explosion of drug deaths. And it's right to say, how can the SNP possibly ask for more laws when they don't even use current laws? And I want to remind members that drugs do harm. It is not just deaths. I have patients coming to see me with significant health harms from drug use. So-called soft drugs like cannabis can cause psychosis, depression, and dependence. Drugs cost money. They are very expensive. People using drugs need to spend more and more money on drugs. And this spend is above everything else and all others, above heating, for their children, above food for their children, above time for their children. Drugs do harm. Never forget. Mm -hmm. Presiding officer, let me return to the matter of levers. We've spoken a lot about supervised drug injection facilities. But what about other levers? What about helping people to get off drugs, treatment, rehabilitation? How's that going? Not very well, actually. The SNP instead cut £19 million from addiction services despite year in, year out record deaths, shamefully ripping away funding from frontline services. They don't like to talk about this, do they? That's why it suited them well to deflect from their own failures and blame Westminster for blocking drug consumption rooms. As for tackling drug dealers, those who prey on our most vulnerable. Well, the SNP really is championing a caring, compassionate drugs policy here. The SNP considers criminals under the age of 25 not mature enough to be treated as adult criminals, though mature enough to make other types of decisions. A 21-year-old cocaine dealer, twice caught trying to shift Class A drugs, which would usually result in a six-month custodial sentence, well, he avoided jail due to the SNP's compassionate sentencing guidelines. If the SNP is serious about being caring and compassionate, they'll commit to ensuring that any Scot who asks for treatment and rehab will get it, and get it in a timely fashion. Backing a fully-fledged right to recovery bill is the way to go. The route to avoid, however, is to simply decriminalise drugs. At a time when highly dangerous synthetic opioids are now on the streets, decriminalisation will simply make it easier for drug dealers and organised crime gangs to operate. And let's not forget, we know the gangs even traffic children as mules to move small quantities around. Let's not drop our guard any further. Presiding officer, uh, my time is running out and I would like to remind the minister in her closing speech to please answer the question Sue Weber put to her a couple of hours ago. These questions are how are drug consumption rooms going to work practically? Will there be independent assessors looking at the data? Will the methodology be made public? And what are the success criteria? Implementation is key, and it is, a com it is incumbent upon the government to have a transparent and clear approach when it comes to the pilot. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. And I call on Marie Todd to wind up, um, up to 5 p.m., Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And thank you to, to all members for contributing to what I think was largely a very helpful, thoughtful and largely constructive debate. I'm going to try in my closing to pick up on the many points that were raised, so please um, bear with me. I'm going to try and get through all of them. I recognise that many of our proposals would have been unthinkable propositions 20 years ago, and clearly some opposition members continue to find them unpalatable today. But I would strongly encourage those who remain sceptical about our approach to explain and to evidence why they believe the current approach is working when it so clearly is not. As Ms Whittam said in her opening speech, support for decriminalisation is no longer an extreme position. The more you speak to those who work in the drug field and those with real experience of the issues that drug users and their families face, the more you realise that a new approach is not radical at all. It's an evidence-based alternative. A big step forward to be sure, but everything we propose has been tried and tested many times over. Yes. Russell Finlay. Thank you. The Minister talks about decriminalisation being the answer. Does she accept that the Lord Advocate has effectively already decriminalised possession of drugs in Scotland? Minister. Uh, no, I don't accept that premise. And I would say in regard to Russell Finlay's comments earlier, I think it's really important that we recognise the difference between decriminalisation and legalisation. Decriminalisation, as proposed by us, is purely relates to personal drug use and it's the removal of criminal pe penalties. And in some jurisdictions, they can be replaced with civil sac sanctions like fines, whilst in others, no penalties are applied. Legalisation is the process of ending or repealing the prohibition of a drug. As a policy, it's often misrepresented as a free-for-all on drugs. In fact, I think Russell Finlay used those very words. However, there are many forms of regulation that can and have been applied to legal markets for substances, ranging from the more restrictive approach we have for some medicines to the less restrictive approach we have for substances for, like caffeine. What is not needed in this debate, what is needed in this debate, let me just say, is an informed evidence-based discussion, not misrepresentation and misinformation. I'm happy to give way. As I said, there are many, there are many issues I want to pick up from the debate. I'm happy to give way this once. Paul oh, Sweeney. I thank the Minister for giving way on that important point. You should make the point that decriminalisation is, in effect, a matter of prosecutorial, uh, prosecutorial discretion and the public interest, and that in, in the sense that prosecution of a possession offence is effectively decriminalised in Scotland, which I support, incidentally, but it's not a matter that requires a legal change to the 1971 Act. Minister. So I'm aware of the members' views on decriminalisation, and I'll come on to explain why we need legislative change as well as decriminalisation and what limits there are on us placed on our progress from the Misuse of Drugs Act. Um, the proposals that we are putting forward are only radical when we focus on cultural norms, prejudice and moral judgments, rather than looking at the evidence of what will reduce harm and support vulnerable people. It's been really interesting to hear members speak of the experiences of some of their constituencies, and I have to absolutely pay credit to Colette Stevenson for reminding us again about the absolutely brutal impact of drugs deaths for a long period of time after people are lost when talking about the death of our brother Brian in 2002. It's a stark reminder, if we need it, that the loss caused by drug deaths knows absolutely no bounds. We've heard some heartbreaking stories in this debate, but we've also heard some really inspiring ones. We shouldn't write off people with drug problems. We shouldn't deny them opportunities available to others simply because they use drugs. We are absolutely clear that stigma kills. People already use drugs despite the criminal sanctions in place. And earlier this year, the UN highlighted that drug use continues to grow despite the harms caused. It's therefore incumbent on us to do absolutely everything we can to reduce those harms, regardless of the moral debate. On the Right to Recovery Bill, we're already committed to taking a human rights-based approach to reducing drug-related deaths and harms. We support the principle of getting more people into treatment and recovery that's right for them. However, despite being told repeatedly that the Right to Recovery Bill is imminent, we've yet to actually see it. So we don't know how the proposals will work and 
practice, including, including if the member would like to explain how the concerns raised at the bill's consultation stage have been addressed. Sue Weber. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Minister for taking my intervention. I think it's been mentioned before that the process of a private member's bill does make it quite challenging in terms of timeline, and we can continue to make that on the record, but we continue to get the same evasive statements from the Scottish Government, making it seem as if the party are not doing enough and Douglas Ross is not doing enough to bring that forward. We have concerns. We want it to come forward, but there's limitations with the private members' bills unit that can manage to cope with the capacity. Thank you. Minister. So, let me assure the Parliament again today that we are absolutely committed to giving the proposed members' bill careful consideration when it's eventually published. We're working hard within the powers that we have to tackle drugs deaths and harms, including investing an additional £250 million over the course of this Parliament to counter Annie Wells and Sandri Sandesh Galhani's claims that budgets are being cut. Let me set out the increases over the last three years. In 2021-22, the total drugs and alcohol budget was £140.7 million. In 2022-23, the total budget was £141.9 million. This budget has increased to 155.5 million in 23-24. Rolling out the MAT standards is a cornerstone of our national mission and setting out what people should expect from services, improving access to services, choice of treatment options, wraparound support to people most at risk from drug harm and drug-related death. And the most recent public health Scotland benchmarking found substantial progress with implementation of the MAT standards throughout the ADP areas, but there is still a lot to do for full, consistent and sustained implementation of the standards across Scotland, and we are fully committed to sustaining this implementation. We will continue to do everything we can to improve service position provision across Scotland. Now, many more people take drugs than present for treatment and support and decriminalising drugs will take them out of the criminal justice system and enable those that do have dependency issues to seek the support they need. Lack of funding isn't the issue here. We've committed an additional £250 million to deliver the national missions on drugs. The majority of funding goes to alcohol and drug partnerships across Scotland, but the funding also supports third sector organisations and core funded organisations. We published the first national mission annual report in November 22, including financial reports to improve transparency and to show the direction and the impact of the funding committed. And in 2022, a total of 106.8 million was available to alcohol and drugs partnerships. Now, a number of people have spoken about safe consumption facilities. I absolutely welcome the position taken by the Lord Advocate as set out in her response to the Justice Committee. The Lord Advocate's position now gives Glasgow the option of setting up a safer drug consumption facility pilot which will operate within existing legislation. Whilst the service will be... Um, yes, one I will do. Thank you for taking a second intervention. And many speakers have spoken about safe consumption rooms, and some have said safer. And I think that's a very important distinction to make. Does the Minister agree that the latter is more accurate because some of these drugs can never be considered to be safe? Minister. Absolutely. wouldn't disagree at all, and that's an unusual situation for myself and that particular member. Whilst the service will be limited in what it can still do, due to the Misuse of Drugs Act, we are absolutely confident that the safer drug consumption facility will save lives. To clarify what we can't do because of the Misuse, drug of Act, uh, of Misuse of Drugs Act, we can't make our safer drug consumption facilities low threshold access. We can't roll out low threshold access to heroin assisted treatment. We can't have an inhalation room, nor can we supply pipes for consumption under the current legal situation. Now, we know that the safer drug consumption room isn't a silver bullet, but we do know from evidence from more than 100 facilities worldwide that safer drug consumption rooms work. It's high time to see that approach piloted in Scotland. Now, if we're to continue to progress on drug consumption 
rooms facilities. We need to do it in a way which has the full confidence of everyone who would use the facility, of the agencies involved and the general public. And that's why we've worked with partners to develop an approach within the current law which will allow for any facility to operate to match, um, maximum effect. Now, a number of people raised the issue of evaluation. Um, Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership will be establishing an evaluation package in line with what the Lord Advocate set out in her response last week on funding. Let me assure members there will be no loss to existing uh, drug and alcohol services. There will be no cuts in order to fund this pilot. Money has been earmarked in the national mission budget in the knowledge that Glasgow might need to proceed very quickly following the Lord Advocate's position. And discussions are ongoing with Glasgow to ensure that the required funding will be made available. On operation, the pilot proposal that went to the Lord Advocate contained full standard operating procedures of the facility, and there's no doubt that Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership will be able to provide the um, pending agreement by it, the, the, the agreement that was made by it once the Integrated Joint Board have a look at that. Um, on staff liability, um, it, it, exactly the same applies as in any other NHS facility. Staff will be fully covered um, by the, um, the liability that is in place in any NHS facility. It will operate just like any other NHS service. Um, on heroin-assisted treatment, that was raised by a number of people, we remain committed to the wider establishment of MAT services across Scotland. And in January this year, we made funding available to Dundee Alcohol and Drug Partnership to allow them to fund a scoping study. And that same funding would be available to any other area that is interested in taking forward this approach. Um, a few contributions this afternoon um, seem to equate... A more humane approach to helping those who take drugs with being soft on crime. So let me be clear, serious organised crime is absolutely no respecter of borders, nor of any society norms, and Scotland is not immune from its impact. The Scottish Government and its partners on the Serious Organised Crime Task Force are fully committed to tackling and reducing the harm it causes to our committees. And that includes disrupting the activities of organised crime groups and holding them to account for the harm they cause to our communities, our businesses, and particularly our most vulnerable. Partners on the Serious Organised Crime Task Force and its um, partners, including COSLA and NHS and Police Scotland, Solace, National Crime Agency, HMRC, will continue to use every means at their disposal to disrupt serious organised crime. And Police Scotland and other law enforcement agencies continue to have significant operational success. And through the UK-wide Operation Veneta, we have um, removed substantial quantities of drugs from our streets, making a number of arrests in the process. And some examples of operational success included the recovery of cocaine with an estimated street value of around a quarter of a million in Murray, £500,000 worth of cannabis in Lanarkshire, and a county lines gang that was jailed for a total of 22 years following the seizure of a significant amount of cash and Class A drugs. Now, in, in the first report of this decade, um, the 7th May 2020, the Global Commission on drug policy outlines how the current international drug control regime works for the benefit of transnational organised crime. It highlights how years of repressive policies targeted at non-violent offenders have resulted in mass incarceration and produced countless adverse impacts on public health, the rule of law and social cohesion, whilst at the same time reforcing a criminal Elite. Now, I'm fairly certain that that international body has no interest in the constitutional wrangling that's going on if I might in ask Scotland. You to conclude, Minister. And I simply highlight it because if that is all it is about, why are so many global institutions asking for a change of law? Presiding officer, in my opening speech, I reflected... Um, Elena Whitam reflected on the shift in how the drugs issue is now considered. It's very much now viewed first and foremost as a public health issue by this government and I think by this parliament as a whole. I believe there's a genuine willingness across the chamber to offer support to those whose lives have been blighted by drug use, 
even if there remain areas of disagreement in how best to offer that support. As we've said previously, this issue is too important. The stakes are too high for this to be an area for political point scoring. We need to be guided by evidence rather must than anecdote. Conclude, Minister. We need to work constructively with other political parties. There's a long way to go, but we've made meaningful first Thank you, steps. Minister. Thank, Thank you. you. That concludes the debate on drug law reform. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business. And there are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. And can I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Sue Webber is agreed to, the amendment in the name of Jackie Bailey will fall. And the first question is that amendment 10490.1 in the name of Sue Webber, which seeks to amend motion 10490 in the name of Elena Whittam on drug law reform, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. The Parliament is not agreed. Therefore, we'll move to a vote. There'll be a short suspension to allow members to access digital voting.